Hello, my name is Egon Chalakian. I am an intelligence educator. I prepare intelligence personnel for clandestine service. The focus of my career has been centered on the intelligence component of national security with a particular emphasis placed on intelligence community practice. I am an active member of the International Association for Intelligence Education, the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation, and a proud founding member of the OSINT Foundation. I am likewise active within the corresponding AI, electromagnetic, and directed energy intelligence and warfare communities as well. As a young man, my initial introduction to the U.S. intelligence community was realized as a junior test and evaluation engineer on the top secret Joint Hughes Tool Company Aircraft Division, U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, LOH-369 VIN Wiretap Project. This project was undertaken at the shadowy Area 51 classified facility. Earlier on in my career, I had the distinct privilege to work with four standing U.S. presidents, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Reagan, and one future president, George Bush Sr. Such privileged early career exposure brought my individual into direct interface with the classified defense intelligence national security communities. Later, having worked with Mr. Reagan during his kitchen cabinet period, and then with the Reagan White House in the early 1980s, I contributed legislative affairs related service in the furtherance of successfully passing the President's Department of Defense Strategic Defense Initiative. It is my honor to address you this day. From the perspective of an intelligence educator, I have been entrusted with unveiling information from our investigation conducted by our team over the past three decades and to publicly disclose the specific outcomes of this work, which compel a reassessment of current geopolitical processes and our country's defense strategy. I am entrusted to convey to the international community the information about a global threat uncovered during our long-term operation. We are faced with a grave challenge that not only affects our national security, but also threatens the foundations of the entire democratic world. This threat concerns everyone, hence you must be informed about it. Firstly, I will be outlining the details of this specific intelligence organization whose operations we have uncovered. It is believed to have been dismantled during the Soviet collapse. However, the facts be otherwise. Instead, that this entity resurrected its clandestine activities in the dark during early 1990s and continued unabated to this date. Intended to disrupt prevailing geopolitical dynamics worldwide, its overall mission is to eviscerate democratic systems and propel the world close to the brink of nuclear conflict. The long-term strategic goal of this foreign intelligence operation is to undermine the integrity of the United States of America and dismantle the foundations of our democracy. While such ambitions may appear unachievable to some, details of our investigation will suggest otherwise. You will come to discern who lurks behind these ambitious plans, how they will inch closer to their designate goals, and how they manipulate the public to achieve their ends. Further, I shall elucidate how we managed to uncover the strategy behind deploying this intelligence network. Our breakthrough was achieved by monitoring an international volunteer organization that was subjected to targeted repression by the entities covering up the aforementioned structure. By virtue of this volunteer organization's non-resistant posture, we were able to fully re-engineer the operational strategy of this intelligence apparatus. Over a decade of meticulous study, we have identified their methods, tactics, the conditions for the formation and expansion of their intelligence network, as well as their methods of influencing global geopolitical processes by asserting the necessary narratives in the media. This exemplar of covert operational work may well become canical and enter the global anthology of intelligence agency operations. 
During my address, you will come to understand why. Moreover, as I am deemed a competent professional in the field of OSINT, that is to say open source intelligence, i.e. disinformation, misinformation, validation, and routinely engaged in monitoring publicly disseminated information by foreign source entities, I assert that my opinion does carry weight. I will provide you with a detailed description of the specific methods employed by the aforereferenced entity in furtherance of manipulating public consciousness. These methods include not only organized disinformation campaign, but also assaults on mass consciousness influence and reality distortion, in addition to a program series of destructive manipulative techniques. All these methods are aimed at forging altering negatives in political and social discourse to influence society's perception and behavior in a direction favorable to this clandestine entity. The actions taken by this entity today pose the most serious threat to our freedom and democracy. My fellow Americans and citizens of the free democratic world, I am addressing each of you at this critical moment with an appeal to be vigilant and to take what I share with you seriously. We are facing an unprecedented threat in the history of our intelligence, as today's digital technologies enable this entity to implement its manipulative methods much more effectively. This is a weapon aimed at the very foundation of our society, the consciousness of every citizen and traditional defense methods simply do not effectively counter this assault. These methods penetrate deeper than any ballistic missile and require a new approach to defense. And this defense cannot be realized without your individual involvement. Our investigation started in 1993 when we began detecting in the international information space traces of intelligence and operational activities, characteristics of an extremely dangerous organization that we had considered already defunct. This was a special division of the former KGB Committee for State Security of the USSR, which was believed, as I said, to have been dismantled during the collapse of the former Soviet Union. During the Soviet era, the activities of this particular KGB structure posed a critical strategic threat to the United States, as in the 1980s, they made attempts to undermine the integrity of our country from within and disrupt democratic unity. The fact that despite the collapse of the former Soviet Union, this clandestine structure of the KGB covertly resumed its operations and actively began to increase its influence on the geopolitical stage caused us extreme concern. We understood that the detailed scrutiny was necessary and such an opportunity was afforded to us 10 years ago. Our investigation has shown that to achieve their goals, they act like the mythical hydra or an octopus, which lies at the very bottom remaining invisible to all. At the same time, it extends its tentacles into people's consciousness influencing their thoughts, their moods, and actions to serve its destructive purposes. At this juncture, it is essential that you understand that the structure is not the entire committee for state security of the former USSR. Instead, we are talking about a fundamental, wholly unique autonomous structure within the contemporary KGB, one that traces its operations back to the 1920s and 1930s. Specifically, a division created under Felix Derzhinsky and headed by Gleb Boki. According to the operational intelligence data we have, the activities of this special division were focused on developing and implementing methods and techniques for influencing the human consciousness. Their primary interests lie in studying and perfecting ancient practices of architects of influence over human consciousness and applying this knowledge to manipulate the masses. This division included psychophysiological special laboratories aimed at studying the human psyche, behavior, and reactions, as well as developing technologies for controlling people's thinking. 
If you are familiar with the history of the USSR, you understand that they achieved remarkable results in mastering the architect of consciousness. They were skilled at implementing desired narratives and thoughts into people's minds, controlling the mood of the masses and making people compliant with the totalitarian regime in the USSR. To a large extent, this structure within the KGB and its creators are the architects of the USSR itself. These were the ones who designed its system and internal ideology. They were the ones who regarded themselves to be the actual state within the state. They were the ones who unofficially stood behind the leaders of the Soviet Union. And they are the ones who brought Russia's current leaders to power and stand behind them. But we'll discuss this in more detail later. It is important to realize that despite numerous changes and reorganizations within the Soviet state security agencies that have taken place since their early inception, the original Felix Dzerzhinsky Gleb Boki developed foundational structure has always remained intact regardless. Within the scope of this address, for the sake of clarity, I will use the term KGB to denote the fundamental structure. This allows us to focus on the essence of the matter without being distracted by historical nuances. It is implied that KGB in this context refers not simply to the security service in its historical manifestation, but to a deep-seated clandestine structure that continues to pose a threat not only to the United States and to Russia, but to the entire world. By observing their activities during the Soviet Union era, we clearly saw that despite the declared goals of the USSR, the true aim of the KGB at that time was to form a fully controlled superstate with a tyrant leader at its helm and subsequently to create their own world government according to their script. Operating in the shadows, they manipulated events in the USSR, holding the country in an iron grip and steering it towards their objectives. However, their plans crumbled in 1991 when we dismantled the USSR without a single shot fired, a triumph to our intelligence services, the intelligence services of the United States. Our special services conducted a brilliant covert operation, achieving the deconstruction of the Soviet Union through natural, peaceful, and nonviolent means. In doing so, we saved the world from the emergence of a tyrannical state that was already forming under the leadership of this special department. If the collapse had not occurred, despotism and tyranny would prevail throughout the world today. At the time, many believed, even in the intelligence circles, that this KGB structure had also been annihilated by achieving the dissolution of the Soviet Union. However, as we discovered in 1993, this specialized KGB department, the successor to the psychophysical research of the Chika and the NKVD, not only survived the chaos of the USSR's collapse, but also found a new purpose, revenge. The collapse of the Soviet Union was perceived by the KGB division as a deep personal humiliation and a tremendous blow to their ego. Firstly, they lost an empire they considered their property and an alienable territory. Secondly, they failed to fulfill their key task, ensuring the security of the USSR, which led to its collapse. Thirdly, the empire they had shaped and led was destroyed by their historical adversaries, the intelligence services of the United States of America. The destruction of the Soviet Union and the successes of our special services were perceived by the KGB as a loss of personal honor and dignity. This became a serious challenge for them. Their primary objective is to destabilize and destroy the integrity of the United States of America as an act of retribution for their past defeat. They do not aim to restore their former empire or conquer new territories. Their current mission is specific, however, the destruction of America by any means available. According to our data, 
The adversary does not limit themselves in their choice or means in this operation. In pursuit of their goal, they are willing to sacrifice not only the lives of individuals and political figures, but also their former territories. They are even prepared to risk a full-scale nuclear conflict if it aligns with their long-term strategy. We must consider this information in our strategic planning and preparation for the defense of national security. It is important to be aware of the perverse psychophysical methods they use and understand that the main battle is fought in your consciousness. It is also crucial to remain committed to upholding your democratic rights and freedoms. By doing so, you can ensure our collective safety and triumph over this KGB Hydra. Their ambitions are fixated on maintaining their incognito advantage and the possibility of gaining the upper hand over American intelligence agencies, a feat they hold as a badge of honor. They operate covertly, right under the noses of global intelligence services. After all, everyone is convinced that their structures do not exist. But this shadow force methodically sabotages plans for crisis resolution and mutual agreements, positioning its political pieces on the chessboard in a way that their actions seem illogical at first glance. However, the logic becomes quite clear once you understand that an invisible hand is behind their actions. And this certainly doesn't imply that the heads of nations, despite their seemingly illogical statements, are recruited agents of the KGB division. Our investigation has revealed that the architects of consciousness can implant the desired destructive image into the mind of their target through a chain of five individuals. The target perceives this image as their own thought or as an idea with a clearly defined purpose for its subsequent actions. However, in reality, they execute strategic tasks essential to the KGB Hydra. This explains why even the heads of nations may make illogical statements, act against common sense, and sow chaos. And now imagine implanting a destructive image into the mind of a leader of a nuclear power. Consider the ramifications this would have for all of humanity. Today, the threat of nuclear war looms as ominous as a setting sun. During our analysis, we have established that the KGB adhere to the highest principle of military art, to defeat the enemy using their own forces. This is an ancient tactic that has been at the heart of the rise and fall of empires, the formation and disintegration of political and religious systems, and the control of the masses. And today this tactic is directed against us, against America and the entire democratic world. Using techniques developed by the KGB and their specialized psychophysical laboratories, and based on knowledge of the architecture of consciousness, the enemy masterfully compels our citizens to act according to preset scenarios by implanting manipulative images and ideas into their minds. As a specialist in intelligence and disinformation, I can explain that the enemy's methods are based on creating and implanting specific images into people's minds, which then become dormant in their thinking and behavior. The enemy utilizes its knowledge and experience to influence the masses through media and the internet, engaging journalists, politicians, and opinion leaders under their control. In this way, the KGB shapes public opinion and political narratives, even without direct contact with key figures. They skillfully manipulate the information space, creating chains of influence that start with one person and spread until the desired effect is achieved. Having prepared the ground, they introduce triggers that activate the necessary images and narratives in a person's mind. Their ultimate goal is to change the population's way of thinking, replacing established beliefs with new ones that will contribute to achieving their strategic interest, undermining the foundations of America and the democratic world. In the next section of my presentation, I will cover in detail the operational aspects of our investigation, specific methods that the enemy has used to achieve 
their strategic goals will be presented. The main focus will be those examples that we can disclose without compromising national security. I will begin with a simple and striking example. This example will show you how close the enemy is to accomplishing its goal of destroying America and the democratic world. My fellow Americans, I come to you today not just as an intelligence expert, but as a fellow citizen of this great nation. I want to address each and every one of you, regardless of your political affiliations, age, gender, race, or social background. I speak to all who call America their country and home. With utmost sincerity, I ask you to answer one simple question. Do you think America is in decline today? Now, just imagine posing the same question to an American 30 years ago. What would the reaction have been? As someone who vividly remembers that time, allow me to shed some light on the topic. No one would ever consider discussing that with you, because at that time, this issue would have seemed utterly absurd. Every American citizen was first and foremost a patriot who firmly believed that America was the greatest country on earth, thriving and destined for a magnificent future. Today the question of America's decline is not only a topic of discussion among Americans at work, with friends, in the office, and within families, but it also elicits a troubling response. You risk hearing a resounding yes far too often when asked. This yes to the question of America's decline is the direct result of the KGB strategy to ideologically erode our nation from within. We are witnessing a catastrophic decline in patriotism. Pride in our country has plummeted to historic lows, particularly among the younger generation. A significant percentage of Americans are losing faith in tomorrow shying away from starting families, reluctant to have children, experiencing decay in spiritual and moral values, and lacking the desire to participate in our society. Social science experts are alarmed by the decline in self-confidence observed in America over the past decade, a phenomenon typically associated with a country that has suffered a devastating defeat in a war or a catastrophic economic crisis. Yet key economic indicators show no signs of decline. America is thriving, boosting the world's most robust economy, growing GDP, stable inflation levels, and unemployment at its lowest in history. Perplexed, these experts ask, what is the source of this loss of faith in themselves and their country among Americans? However, it is they who ask this question. We know perfectly well that a hybrid psychological war against the U.S. is in full swing, and it has not stopped for a second since the KGB's activation in 1993. Their brutal methods of ideological subversion of our society are working inside your heads right now, directed against you and against America. And here's the proof. When I said that there is no economic decline and that America is thriving, you had objections. What about safety issues, rising housing prices, problems with health care, debt, drugs, shootings, and so on? In your mind, you began to list numerous reasons why Americans should be dissatisfied with America, outraged and disappointed, and you started to justify this loss of patriotism. Am I wrong? You began to defend the state of America's decline. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the listed problems don't need to be addressed. I'm talking about something else. What has happened to us Americans? What happened to our thinking? When and how have we become proponents of America's decline instead of its greatness? We are Americans. We are the heirs of a great history full of overcoming challenges and gaining victories. 
Doesn't the collective legacy of our ancestors not amply demonstrate that America can handle its own problem? Our nation, our ancestors, tirelessly worked to develop our country. They knew they were part of something bigger, something grand. The image of a great and strong America gave them the strength to fight for their rights and freedom when it seemed unattainable. The image of a great and strong America gave them the strength to build where it seemed impossible to build anything. The image of a great and strong America gave them the strength to stick together in moments when the enemy tried to divide them. But what is the enemy doing to us today? Our enemy is trying to take away from us the image of a great and strong America. Our enemy is trying to take away from us the mighty America that our ancestors built for us, inspired by its bright future, its prospects, and its greatness. The enemy today, contrary wise, is trying to replace our strong and glorious America with a false image of America as a weak, toxic, hopeless, disintegrating state. A state whose interests you would not want to defend, in whose life you do not wish to participate, on whose land you would not want to live, start a business or raise a family. A state that you would not mind losing and would be prepared to disband with your own hands. And here it is, the enemy's victory, which begins in our heads, the demoralization of American society and the substitution of its fundamental ideological foundation, the image of America. Our forefathers managed to build a strong America because they saw it as strong. But now, when we see America as weak, we make it weak and contribute to its destruction. And this can only benefit the enemy. How does the KGB ensure that the image of a weak America with no future appears in the minds of Americans? They use information warfare methods developed by these consciousness architects in the behavioral science laboratories. The implementation of the KGB strategy of demoralization and destroying the enemy with his own hands begins imperceptibly in the media under the influence of KGB agents Thoughts about the deterioration of life in the country, the disunity of the people, the weakness of our leaders, the country's loss of strength, and the superiority of foreign states appear with increasing frequency. Often such messages are embedded in a neutral, non-political context, as this way they can penetrate your consciousness without critical analysis. You unconsciously agree with them, changing your initial beliefs, and as a result, you begin to doubt the country, the future, and yourself. To ensure that thoughts of disappointment in America firmly settle in your mind, KGB agents deliberately introduce declining narratives, not only into journalist materials, but also into the language of public figures, including politicians. Under the influence of KGB agents, the emotional tone of the news is artificially changed to a pessimistic one. Open studies show that since 2018, the tone of economic news in the United States has become more negative, despite stable economic indicators. And since 2020, the mood of the news has become even gloomier. As a result, today we see young people, the future of our nation, losing faith in America under the influence of distorted images imposed from the outside. They are descending into inaction, delusion, apathy, and even worse, drug addiction. The lack of critical thinking makes them vulnerable to psychological manipulation, undermining the foundations of our democratic society. Notice that this trend is not limited to our country alone. It is spreading throughout the Western world, where young people are losing faith in democratic values and principles, just as in America. Perhaps you're wondering how KGB agents appear in American and global mass media. Today we will talk about this in detail. But for now, I'll say briefly that our investigation has shown that as part of the KGB's global strategy to undermine democracy, 
One of their tactical objectives is to expand their network of agents within the global mass media arena. This task involves not only recruiting journalists, but likewise requires identifying potential agents among them, whose personal characteristics are compatible with future KGB. That is to say, journalists who are pliable, greedy, susceptible to extortion, prone to bribery, and willing to spread lies. The KGB seeks journalists guided solely by selfish interest rather than ethical interest. They need journalists who are indifferent to their country's national security and long-term future. I ask you all, do you not see vivid examples of such evidence manifested on our television screens every day in contemporary America? Anyway, the KGB needs journalists who are ready to betray their state's interest and not ashamed to work for the enemy. It is with the aid of such journalism's worst representatives that the KGB advances its destructive narratives in global media, both politically and socially, steering our democratic society towards self-destruction. To discreetly but effectively identify such dishonest and most importantly, easily controlled individuals among the ranks of global media, the KGB conducts a series of non-standard information operations that can last for years, sometimes decades. One such operation, which you will learn about in detail today, involves the KGB organizing high-profile disinformation campaigns aimed at deliberately discrediting various organizations or individuals. The purpose of these disinformation campaigns orchestrated by the KGB is to identify those journalists who are willing to create and spread slander and lies, willfully destroying the reputation of individuals, those ready to violate journalistic ethics, rights, and freedoms of others, thereby opposing the constitution of their country and democracy itself. The fact that the KGB is forced to invest a lot of time and effort to identify and recruit suitable journalists underscores that the majority of representatives of global journalism are indeed honest and decent people who stand guard over freedom and truth and do not succumb to attempts at manipulation. The few journalists who succumb to bribery, lies, and deceit constitute the active media army of the KGB, which is currently being used to undermine the foundations of global democracy and, most frighteningly, to destroy America. It's critical to note that the KGB remains unnoticed as an entity in these activities. They carry out their operations through third parties. Recruited agents identify new agent prospects, distribute informational tasks and guidelines, and convey the right ideas to specifically receptive individuals. Through these targeted actions, we receive deliberate doses of poison in the information space, contaminating our minds, thoughts, and hopes. They implant hopelessness and disillusionment about our own country within us. The toxic images that the enemy is implanting in the minds of Americans through their agents of influence today are not only those of a weak and debilitated America. It is the image of a destroyed America. This embedded image consequently culminates in adverse events for the U.S. on the global stage. Let me explain. With a sufficient degree of confidence, I have every good reason to believe that the forthcoming November U.S. election will be undertaken with minimal KGB interference. However, the following U.S. election cycle in 2028 will be an entirely different story. At this latter point in time, I am confident that the KGB will be in full control of the U.S. national election influencing mechanism, which will lead to a subsequent civil war in the United States, developed upon a KGB-orchestrated U.S. political divide, where Americans will be killing each other with brutality and hatred, not even suspecting that they are doing so for the sake of the KGB's victory. Does this scenario seem unreal to you? More than 10 years ago, the people of Russia and Ukraine harbored a similar impression, I rather suspect. 
They also believed that a war between their countries was unimaginable. Yet now it's happening in reality. They are dying by the hundreds of thousands at each other's hands. But who is truly behind this conflict? While we are led to believe every day that one sole individual, i.e. Vladimir Putin, is wholly responsible for this entire conflict, do we honestly believe that the KGB does not have its fingers in this pie? What purpose does the war in Ukraine serve and whose interests are being advanced? By the end of my address, you will understand the answers to these questions. May I suggest that you entertain the following thought. Sometimes a simple fight in the front yard is often executed merely so that everyone is looking at the front yard in order to divert their attention from the father of the family being murdered in the back bedroom of the house. And with regard to the civil war in America, which I mentioned earlier on, this is what you are currently being conditioned for right now. Do you not hear more and more about the succession of states from the Union each day within the rhetoric of our political discourse, delivered by our trusted journalist? The question I routinely ask myself, is this a journalist I am listening to or a foreign entity messenger? Is it not reasonable to believe that a seed is being planted in you, preparing for a future harvest? Fellow Americans, I want to re-emphasize that the contemporary offspring of the original Soviet KGB Committee for State Security of the USSR does not play on behalf of Russia or any other country. Instead, they are driven exclusively by revenge against the United States. Put politely, they want payback, leaving no room for mediation. That is why the danger we face is colossal and unique. We are dealing with an enemy that wears no uniform, recognizes no borders, and is not waiting for a formal declaration of war to be proclaimed by the United States Congress. The apparatus this enemy employs against America has already permeated borders of this country. By virtue of its ability to implant fabricated conscious manipulated regulation of the public psyche. Therefore, your awareness and critical thinking skills ought to be first line of defense. After all, the foundation of America is you. Governed by your personal thoughts and beliefs, America's foundation is merely a reflection of the indomitable positive belief we harbor for the future of this country. The enemy is robbing us of our belief in America's future and aggressively undertakes a campaign centered on eroding our democratic foundation. From my perspective, it is ironic to realize that America is being successfully attacked by a Soviet KGB designed invisible illusion. Voluntarily received via television and social media platforms and routinely touted by our politicians daily. This is why I am making this address directly to the American public to ensure America's security. I urge you to view this entire video until its end. It's our collective responsibility to counter the manipulative influence imposed upon the American public by the KGB. American citizens are turning on their own country by virtue of this deceptive information campaign created, administered, and visited upon the United States by its acknowledged adversary, the KGB. Only by knowing and acknowledging this inside can you then entertain the prospect of reversing the damage already realized. Early on in the course of our investigation, our team determined that it was best to allocate our energies and resources in furtherance of reverse engineering the methodology employed by the KGB in their ongoing efforts to recruit foreign agents from within the media structures. From this isolated posture, we undertook a selective 10-year observation and examination of the practices and protocols embraced by KGB. To the same end, and in furtherance of providing you with a bit more about my background in the former USSR, as a young professional, I was selected to serve as one of a handful of Comic-Con legal financial professionals formally authorized by the US Department of State 
and the Bank of Foreign Trade of the USSR, also known as the Russian Ministry of Finance, to undertake joint U.S.-Russian international commercial transactions. In fact, I was the lead syndicator of the largest Western loan ever made to the former Soviet Union. Given the significance of this professional appointment, it would be reasonable to assume that I had free access to the most powerful corridors of the Supreme Soviet. While enjoying an extraordinary degree of monitored freedom of travel within the former Soviet Union, I became affiliated with a closed group of scientists engaged in rather sophisticated climate change research, centered on the impact of climate change upon the Earth, seeking viable solutions. I would add, the same affiliation was realized before the U.S. was introduced to the pressing issue of climate change, and this affiliation developed over the ensuing years. The large-scale and unique approach to research conducted by this group of scientists required extensive data collection and analysis, and volunteers from various countries worldwide provided invaluable assistance in this endeavor. The international public movement, ALATRA, which will be discussed further, later emerged thanks to these volunteers. These volunteers conducted meticulous research and analyzed data on the climate and geodynamics of the planet, from ancient mentions to the present day. Regardless, from the early 2014 period, I began to hear rumors of volunteer service providers involved in the climate movement being targeted in public smear campaigns, and this is where the story begins. While recognizing, as already indicated earlier on, I harbor a personal and professional interest in the intelligence community-driven activities, and because of my keen interest, coupled with my involvement with both former Soviet Union and emerging Russian Federation, our team quietly commenced the study of KGB disinformation, misinformation activities visited upon both Russian and foreign citizens alike. Accordingly, the smear campaign I just mentioned garnered our undivided attention. With this said, before I delve into the detailed description of the KGB's destructive methods and the specifics of their operation to discredit the mentioned organization, ALATRA, I would like to explain what this organization is and under what circumstances I became acquainted with it, as these details play a significant role in understanding the whole picture. So, ALATRA is a volunteer movement that was born out of people's deep concern over the global threat of climate change. The movement's participants operate in 180 countries worldwide, fully complying with international law and the legislation of the countries where they are present. Through their socially significant research projects, ALATRA volunteers have made and continue to make substantial contributions to achieving the UN's key goals aimed at creating a sustainable future for all humanity. Through meticulous scrutiny conducted by competent authorities, it has been established that ALATRA has never had and does not have any financial support from government agencies, commercial organizations, or other interested parties. The volunteers of this movement act entirely independent within the framework of the law, observing all applicable legal norms and principles. In today's reality, the activities of a lot of volunteers serve as a shining example of genuine democratic cooperation and the embodiment of civic responsibility. So, let's return to the story of the beginning of my involvement with this organization. In 2014, our intelligence community noticed that an organized smear media campaign had begun against the Alatra movement, which initially unfolded through religious media portals and then shifted to the realm of secular media. This approach was familiar to us. Having observed the activities of the KGB since 1993, we knew that one of their tactics for expanding their influences was the public deformation of organizations and individuals to identify their potential agents in the global media and political circles. In this case, the KGB resorted to using another informational pretext for public discrediting, the persecution of dissenters by the dominant religious organization. 
Undoubtedly, we were aware that the KGB historically utilized religious organizations and their associated structures to implement their plans. However, it was necessary to determine exactly how they are exploited for expanding the KGB's network of agents, how the recruitment of new agents occurs in this process, and how the necessary KGB narratives are promoted in the global media space through their participation. Therefore, to understand who and what stands behind the deprimation and persecution of Latra by religious organizations, we began to meticulously track this process. I should note that our team did not interfere with Alatra's affairs, but merely closely monitored the persecution of this organization, seeing in it a key to unraveling the mystery. However, from 2015 to 2016, when the organization successfully defended its rights in court, it became clear that their continued defense efforts could stop the persecution against them. Then our adversaries in the KGB would switch to another target. That jeopardized the ability to thoroughly study the method of forming their network of influence. So we suggested to the volunteers that they should not resist the persecution to allow events to unfold naturally and reveal the hidden mechanisms of the KGB's activities. This suggestion was relayed through mutual acquaintances and it was accepted. We anticipated that the organization's vulnerability would cause the enemy to relax and lose vigilance. And our plan worked. The lack of consequences and impunity led KGB agents to make mistakes, and we were able to expose their methods of operation. I must admit, when we proposed that the volunteers do not resist, we also gave our word to ensure their safety, and I personally vouch for that. However, Regretfully, we could only guarantee that safety within democratic states. In countries with a different societal order, the volunteers, despite all efforts, faced not only moral humiliation, but also physical persecution and threats. This burden of responsibility lies with me, and I acknowledge that before you. Today, I am taking on a new responsibility on behalf of the Alatra International Public Movement Organization, Alatra. Alatra is a duly registered U.S. 501c3 not-for-profit entity. It is registered in the state of Georgia, USA. Specifically recognizing that Alatra membership and volunteer assistance, domestic and international, are currently being targeted worldwide by a clandestine arm of the former Soviet KGB. Henceforth, my individual will be the sole Alatra representative in all matters interfacing with the U.S and any and all foreign governments. To this end, the corresponding U.S. Foreign Agent Registration Act FAR, application submission will be realized with the U.S. Department of Justice National Security Unit before the end of April 2024. In concert with the same endeavor, the Alatra organization will likewise be represented on Capitol Hill and in the European community by my being serving as their designate registered federal lobbyist inasmuch as I have become well apprised of Alatra's plight at the direction of the KGB. I have already encouraged Alatra leadership to make the situation known to the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, in addition to the U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, encouraging an investigation of the abuses imposed upon Alatra membership constituents, and have been duly apprised by Alatra that such contact has been formally commenced. Moving forward, my individual likewise has been retained as the official spokesperson of Alatra International Public Movement as well. It is a particular honor for me to defend Alatra and its volunteers because it is thanks to the patience and perseverance of these people who have endured public discredit, persecution, and harassment for 10 years that we have been able to uncover specific schemes of the covert operations of the KGB to expand its network of agents. This is the first instance where we have had the opportunity to gain not just a fragmentary, but a comprehensive insight into the tactical methods employed by the KGB, allowing us to now develop an effective line of counteraction against them. The discoveries made, thanks to Alatra, have been a critical contribution to protecting democratic society 
from the influence of the destructive structure of the KGB, encountering the revenge of this shadow force. I want to mention that despite our prolonged observation and study of the persecution case against the Latra, we intentionally avoid direct contact with the volunteers until a critical moment. The looming need necessitated contact with them as the geopolitical tension in society foreshadowed the beginning of a new phase of their persecution. Furthermore, we understood that sooner or later we would have to draw public attention to the KGB operation we uncovered, and I was tasked with fulfilling that role. Therefore, it was only on November 15, 2022, on Capitol Hill, amid the bustling debates of an international conference, that I approached the American representatives of Alatra to establish contact. It was my first personal meeting with representatives of the movement. Throughout further interactions, I became convinced that they are honest and decent people. Their main goal is to address the fundamental climate crisis facing the earth today. When we began our social interaction, I intentionally actively participated in their public activities, including international forums and conferences. According to our plan, I became the sole public face of our intelligence community and declared my open position and connection with Alatra. We decided to create an independent media platform to serve as a launching pad specifically for my address today. I primarily made a series of high-profile video addresses to draw public attention to this platform. I affirm the seriousness of every statement I have made previously and take responsibility for every word I have uttered. However, today's address is the primary goal and reason for launching the platform. We had planned to inform you and make this present statement as early as autumn 2023. However, we refrained from doing so due to the then upcoming presidential elections in Russia. We simply did not want our statement to be perceived as interference in the elections, nor did we want to influence the conscious choice of the Russian citizens. Unlike the KGB Hydra, we remain civilized even during times of war. We chose this format to deliver my message for a few reasons. Firstly, we understand perfectly well that the KGB operatives have permeated different levels of the media and have a number of politicians under their influence. Therefore, we decided that the statement should be made through an independent channel where we can regulate our own discourse, unabated by any parties or agencies privy to the matter at hand. We strive for an open dialogue so that you can hear and understand my message in a calm environment, undistracted by external interference. In the future, undoubtedly, there will be press conferences, official investigations, even Senate hearings and other events along with strong pronouncements on this issue. It is inevitable, but right now the most important thing is to convey this information directly to you personally. You are an integral component in the enemy's strategy. Therefore, it is your position that needs to be strengthened, strengthened with knowledge and truth. The choice for such a direct communication format is driven by the fact that in the war waged by the KGB against America, the battlefield is your mind. To explain to you maneuvers of the enemy and to ensure you do not fall victim to them, an honest, candid, and extensive conversation is required. Whereas at a press conference, you would only receive a fragmented understanding of what is happening. Your fragmented understanding plays into the hands of the enemy because they can easily manipulate your fragmented perception of facts and distort them to their advantage. Our goal is to provide you with a holistic understanding of what is happening to show the casual connections and to help you learn to discern the manipulative tactics that KGB agents use against you. You need to learn how to distinguish the false images created by the architects of consciousness from the, your true ones and how to develop critical thinking. All this takes time and explanation. That is why we have arrived at this communication format, where in a calm setting we can explain everything to you in detail. If you do not grasp the full essence of what is said the first time and need to re-listen, you can do so whenever convenient for you. 
And once you understand it yourself, you can explain it to those who don't. Societal cohesion is far more vital than noisy debates and official statements. We realize that KGB agents have permeated quite deeply into the media space. Still, we are confident that there are many democratic media outlets and journalists who are not subject to their influence and who value freedom of speech, truth, and democracy. We are confident that such media will support our common cause. We are allowing every media outlet to independently determine its position, to choose democracy or the side of the KGB. That is why we also chose the direct communication format based on the principle of freedom of choice. We are prepared for a lengthy investigation process, during which time everyone involved in KGB activities will be identified and held accountable. No one will be able to evade responsibility and everyone who acted against democracy and in the interest of the KGB will face well-deserved punishment. We have accumulated extensive facts and evidence during the course of our investigation. However, we will refrain from disclosing such intimate insights so as not to compromise the integrity of such investigatory labors. Instead, I will be providing you with enough information for you to grasp the scale of the threat and how to counter it. I want you to note that only our descendants will be able to fully appreciate the scale and importance of the message I am delivering today. Now, let's dive into the heart of our investigation. Why did the KGB choose Alatra as a victim in their sophisticated information war? First and foremost, Alatra has no one backing them. The organization has no patrons, no protection from the political establishment of any country, and no external funding. It's simply a free, voluntary association of people, which makes it highly vulnerable to a smear campaign. Secondly, Alatra volunteers are actively engaged in public activities in many countries around the world. The organization is known on an international level, which means that for the KGB, this is an opportunity to use the precedence of their persecution to create new agents of influence in the media and political circles of many countries. And thirdly, Alantra engages exclusively in lawful and transparent activities, bringing tremendous benefit to society. This is precisely why the KGB chose it as a testing ground for refining information warfare methods. In this case, KGB used a law-abiding organization in order to launch a campaign of discrediting against it, artificially creating a negative image and provoking journalists to produce slanderous and false materials about it. Thus, dishonest journalists actively involved in the smear campaign against Alatra become KGB agents and working channels for further spreading the KGB's destructive narratives to the masses. These actions are part of a broader strategy aimed at systematically undermining the foundations of democracy worldwide. And most paradoxically, such operations are conducted by the KGB right under the noses of the world's intelligence services, including in our own country, dear Americans. So let's delve into the details and facts. Let's examine using the persecution of the Alatra organization as an example. How exactly a KGB orchestrated discrediting campaign unfolds and what manipulation methods are employed to influence your mind. Let's start with a simple example. Before you, here are two classic defamatory articles about the Alatra organization. As you can see, they have similar titles, contain identical demonizing phrases and labels, and globally share negative rhetoric regarding the organization and its volunteers. However, despite the obvious similarity in narratives, these articles are authored by different individuals, published in different publications, and even in different countries. Countries that have been actively opposing each other since 2014 and since 2022 are in a state of acute military conflict. 
and their usual rhetoric in the media space is diametrically opposed. These countries are Ukraine and Russia. However, paradoxically, in this case, despite the total hostility between these two states, we observe a remarkable similarity in the content of these defamatory articles. I want to draw your attention to the specific identical stigmatizing terms used in both countries to label the Elantra movement. These terms include sect, totalitarian sect, and destructive sect. These terms are primarily characteristic of post-Soviet countries because they were deliberately introduced and spread in their media space to form a negative and adverse attitude towards those to whom they have applied. The term totalitarian sect was introduced into wide circulation in the post-Soviet space in 1993 and it was used to define organizations that pose a danger to people and the state. The term destructive sect is synonymous with the concept of a destructive cult and refers to organizations that cause physical or moral harm to individuals and society. Thus, by using the term destructive sect in relation to the Alatra organization, journalists, the authors of slanderous articles in both countries, unjustly accuse Alatra participants of causing harm to people and society, something they have not done. Specifically note that the article's text in both countries features similar or identical rhetoric, identically insulting comparisons targeting the organization, identical phrases taken out of context. Also, journalists exploit the existing animosity between countries crafting false accusations against the Alatra organization that align with the political and ideological sentiments of each country's residents. Take a look for yourself. For residents of Russia, journalists label Alatra as pro-Ukrainian sect, pro-American sect, sect funded by the West, and as a project of the SBU, Security Service of Ukraine, and so on. And for residents of Ukraine, on the contrary, Alatra is labeled as a pro-Russian sect, sect of Russian world, and a project of FSB, Federal Security Service of Russia. Moreover, such emotionally stigmatizing labels are used as Putin's sect, sect that worships Putin, and sect where Putin is their god. This method is based on making accusations that have no real basis, but serve as a kind of trigger for negative reverberations within the respective country. According to the discrediting campaign orchestrated by the KGB, in Russia, Alatra is labeled pro-Ukrainian, and funded by the West, while in Ukraine it's deemed pro-Russian and financed by Russian intelligence services. These are absurd accusations that contradict each other. The use of identical discrediting methods in both countries where even article headlines sound alike with only the names of intelligence services changing depend on the audience. Further evidence of meticulously planned disinformation campaign with a single instigator. The fact that identical fabricated accusations against the Watra are echoed from countries at war with each other indicates the presence of a third party interested in this, which has influence over the media in both of these countries and whose influence remains strong even in times of war. And here arises the inevitable question, who is this instigator? And what kind of force is capable of imposing its unified narrative in the media space of two warring countries? This force is the KGB Hydra, obsessed with its revenge. And for this force, the terrible war between two countries is just one precisely calculated tactical step and a long-term strategy aimed at destroying the foundations of democracy in our society and America as a state. But how has the KGB managed to remain undetected by the intelligence services of the world's nations all this time? So what are the unique features of the enemy's strategy? They lie in two key aspects. Firstly, the information attacks orchestrated by the KGB are carried out by their apparatus not directly but through a system of two-tiered camouflage. 
The KGB uses two front organizations as cover, within which KGB agents are present. These organizations perform the primary dirty work in discrediting campaigns. The KGB Hydra mask its interest under the guise of these organizations' interest while remaining unnoticed itself. The second feature of the KGB's information war strategy is the creation of a high profile and most importantly, long lasting precedent that is intentionally prolonged over time and gains domestic and international coverage. This strategy allows the KGB to involve and thus bring under its influence a greater number of media outlets, public figures, human rights organizations, and governmental bodies, not only in the countries under the primary influence of the KGB, but also beyond their borders. The execution of this KGB strategy results in its agents appearing virtually everywhere, across all spheres and sectors of our society. While analyzing the KGB's information strategy to discredit Alatra, we naturally noticed that the first publication containing allegations against Alatra came from the perspective of the church, specifically the Moscow Patriarchate. A series of articles with identical rhetoric and secular publications followed that. Moreover, these materials clearly deviated from the standard editorial policy of these media outlets which is one of the indications that the articles were commissioned. Take a look at the timeline of the appearance of discrediting publications about Alatra, starting from 2015. Pay special attention to the publication highlighted in red and dark burgundy. These are the articles that served as catalyst and initiated a series of subsequent publications referring to them. It is important to note that these catalyst articles often originated from platforms belonging to or associated with a specific religious organization, the Russian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. This is the first front organization through which the information attack on the Alatra movement is conducted. For simplicity in this discussion, I will refer to it simply as the Russian Orthodox Church or the ROC. As it was revealed, the slanderous materials published on church resources not only triggered a chain reaction in the media space, but also shaped the main narrative that other publications adopted, both in Russia and Ukraine, as well as other countries. It was the Russian Orthodox Church sources that first resorted to the time-tested technique of demonization and attaching the aforementioned stigmatizing labels such as occult sect, pseudo-religious cult, totalitarian sect, and destructive sect to Alatra. Of course, given the absence of unbiased scientific expertise, a corresponding court decision or factual evidence journalists had no legal grounds for using such terms about this organization. However, secular media outlets picked up on these same narratives that disparaged Alatra. This also indicates that a bribery campaign was organized in the media, involving journalists and editors. Otherwise, no sensible person would publish false material that poses a potential threat to the media outlet's reputation. It's particularly striking why the leading media outlets in Ukraine, including state media, have picked up narratives originally stemming from the Russian Orthodox Church. To discredit the Alatra organization, a traditional set of anti-cult methods was employed. These methods have been used throughout the history of our society and were refined in the psychophysical laboratories of the KGB. Today you can witness the applications of these sophisticated techniques designed to manipulate your opinion about politicians, public figures, and organizations. For instance, there's the white thread sewn into black cloth method. The essence of this method lies in deliberately drawing associations between the Alatra organization and destructive terrorist extremist structures as well as religious organizations that have harmed society or have a widely known negative reputation within the context of a publication. 
This is done to transfer the negative characteristics of these structures onto Alatra and manipulate the perception of the reader or viewer. Just like a white thread sewn into black cloth appears gray from a distance and you need to look closer to see its true color, the same applies to uncovering the truth about an organization's activities. However, using the fact that most people simply don't have the time to double check or deeply analyze the information they receive, the architects of consciousness masterfully manipulate images and create the opinion they want about the target organization or individual through such publications. Another method used to manipulate your perception of information about an organization or individual is the fake victim method. In this case, a slanderous article features a person who allegedly suffered from the organization's activities although members of the organization do not even know them. Often such stories are simply fabricated, following an identical plot, and their purpose is to play on the emotions of viewers or readers and evoke hostility towards the target organization. There is also an even more dangerous variation of this method, which can be called the method of imposed crimes. In this case, a target organization or individual is falsely linked to someone who has committed serious crimes but has absolutely no connection to the said organization or individual. This fabricates a precedent that inflates a negative image, becoming informational stigma that is massively replicated from article to article. Another classic method of distorting information that can influence your perception and create a completely opposite image of the target organization or individual in your mind is the selective use of information taken out of context. For example, when a person's phrases, words, or reactions are deliberately taken out of their original meaning, forming context and intentionally interpreted in a completely absurd way. Such manipulation of information so radically distorts perception that white turns into black and black into white. For instance, the blogging materials of a watcher participants, including those containing elements of humor, satire, irony, and entertainment, were used as pretext for unlawful accusations and stigmatization of a watcher and its volunteers as part of an information attack. In slanderous articles, these materials are deliberately taken out of context and falsely interpreted, focusing the reader's and viewer's attention on a narrow range of fragmentary information while ignoring the broad context of a watcher's activities. After all, the blogging activity of its participants, covering a wide range of formats and topics, merely reflects the diversity of their interest, their knowledge, and specializations and has a single goal in mind, to attract public attention to the severity of global climate problems through any possible means. In the course of advancing this information war, the adversary is not interested in real goals and objectives of members of target organization because these members are merely objects of persecution and a means to achieve their hidden interest. At the core of all KGB information attacks is one fundamental element, lies. The more absurd they are, the more effective. It's not just misconceptions or distortions of facts, it's deliberate lies about the activities of organizations or undesirable political or public figures that become targets of such attacks. The primary tool used in these operations is demonization. In this way, the KGB, using the Russian Orthodox Church as a puppet organization and employing the above described manipulative methods in the media, demonized the association of ordinary volunteers, Alatra, by dressing a defensive lamb in wolf skin. They needed to artificially create the monster they required to involve the masses in its persecution. These masses, through their participation in the persecution, became de facto carriers and disseminators of KGB narratives, which means they become accomplices and tools of their revenge. The methods of manipulating public consciousness that we have examined 
which are used by KGB agents to discredit Alatra, are not something new. These methods, along with many others, have long been used by the architects of consciousness, whose successors are the KGB. They were even employed in the most famous unjust trial in the history of mankind. But we will talk about that later. For now, let's just return to our investigation. Since we already understood the strategy and tactics of the adversary and their modus operandi, we were able to register a significant increase in KGB activity in 2020. Our analyst identified a series of social and economic markers indicating that the adversary had entered an active phase of operations and begun mobilization measures to achieve their ultimate goal. In the same year, 2020, we noticed a sharp, unprecedented surge in discrediting publications about Alatra. This in turn meant that there had been a significant influx of financial resources into this discrediting campaign for bribing even more journalists. This suggests that the KGB urgently needed to increase the number of their agents of influence in the media. It's important to note that the discrediting of Alatra is just one of many elements of their global plan. The fact that there was a spike in activity concerning Alatra meant that the KGB also intensified its efforts in other areas in a similar manner. And since such discrediting operations serve as suppliers of new agents of influence for them, they increased the infusion of funds into these operations. This can be compared to a military mobilization. In 2020, the KGB urgently needed new soldiers of influence in their army. As we now know, rapid mobilization is carried out before a large-scale attack. Each new agent for them is a new button on the control panel, allowing them to orchestrate events on the world stage in even greater detail. We understood that the critical strategic point they were preparing for was 2028. According to their calculations, this would be the year when their installed figure would take the seat of the U.S. president. Being directly controlled by them, this person would make a series of decisions resulting in the beginning of a civil war in America. However, to achieve this outcome, they need to have a sufficient number of agents of influence in America who contribute to the imperceptible ideological decomposition of the country and the penetration of destructive narratives into the minds of Americans. If more journalists are needed, a new newsworthy event is required as part of the discrediting campaign. And in 2020, they orchestrated it. Let's use Elantra as an example to demonstrate how to create a classic, resonant, newsworthy event to attract media journalists from different countries to cover it. As we discovered during the operation to expand its agent network, the KGB applied a complex camouflage system, including using two levels of cover. On the timeline, one can distinctively trace a pivotal moment in the campaign to discredit the Elantra organization. The catalyst was a statement by the Chelyabinsk Diocese, published on the official website in 2020. There they expressed concern about the activities of Latra. This diocese plays a key role in the KGB strategy, creating the image of an active struggle against an undesirable organization. Thus, the first level of KGB cover became the Chelyabinsk Diocese of the Russian Orthodox Church. This media event triggered a chain of sequential events. What immediately draws attention is that articles of similar content appeared on same day on many regional resources referring to this diocese. These publications had similar demonizing headlines formulated in a uniform style. These are the signs of pre-coordinated media campaign. Shortly after materials and videos referring to the concerns of the Chelyabinsk Diocese were published in federal-level media outlets. A federal television channel in Russia using the Chelyabinsk Diocese concerns as a precedent released a video story that disparaged the activities of Lantra participants. Other media outlets, including international ones, began to refer to this story. 
an active stage of involving foreign media in the process was launched. This precedent is notable in that the Chelyabinsk diocese concerns found support in the European Union and Ukrainian media, countries that were already opposing Russia at that time. Despite the apparent lack of logic in such support, it remains an indisputable fact. The concern of the Chelyabinsk diocese about Elantra's activities became a planned step in this strategy. It is worth noting that the other Russian Orthodox Church dioceses had also published similar concerns on their resources before this incident, but that did not receive nearly the same media coverage. Apparently, the goal was to draw attention specifically to the Chelyabinsk diocese and divert it from the real actors handling the agent network. Thus, conditions were created such that any investigation into actions against Alatra would lead exclusively to the Chelyabinsk diocese. Look again at this timeline, which reflects the mass release of publications discrediting Alatra. It is important to note that this is far from a complete picture. In order to finance such a number of articles and stories in leading media outlets in different countries, huge sums of money would be required. To give you an idea, let me provide you with a concrete example. According to unofficial but factual data, publishing an article in only one of the leading European outlets cost around 100,000 US dollars. And on this timeline, there are numerous defamatory articles that were published on the front pages of European publications and video stories that aired during prime time on television. Calculate for yourself how much such a disinformation campaign would approximately cost. Why would the church spend so much money to discredit a simple social movement? If suppressing Alatra was the main goal of the Russian Orthodox Church, which seeks to become a titular religion, more economical and effective methods would have been chosen. Moreover, due to their nature, these people would never have spent such money. Ultimately, given the influence and connections of the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia, the organization could have been closed at the very beginning of the inception without allowing it to spread. Why spend so much church money? And what is the interest of the Russian Orthodox Church itself in fighting Elantra in this way? Did the clergy really fear competition from a secular volunteer organization that is not even religious? Clearly, this disinformation campaign has other objectives, indicating that its ultimate beneficiary is not the church at all. It was the KGB's ears sticking out of this hat. If an independent investigation were to be conducted without prior knowledge, you would be unlikely to detect the KGB's interest in the scheme. Let's recall that historically, under the USSR, the church was linked with the NKVD, that's the predecessor to the KGB. That is, from the moment of the KGB's creation, its agents have systematically occupied key positions at all levels of the hierarchy ladder of the Russian Orthodox Church. For example, the current head of the Russian Orthodox Church, who ran intelligence operations for the KGB in the past, continues to reflect the interest of the KGB in his current role. Let me reveal another fact to you. After noticing an unusual increase in KGB's financial contributions to information attacks in 2020, indicating a rise in their preparations for retaliation, we made a decision to provoke them. Since the primary method of disguise for the KGB in the scheme is to manipulate public opinion under the guise of fighting religious dissent. We decided to play on their field. Through our mutual acquaintances, we suggested that a lot of volunteers hold a series of conferences on religious topics. Soon, several international online conferences were organized, focusing on analyzing Islam and Christianity's historical development. These conferences were based on verified scientific research and were conducted within the framework of law and general principles of democracy. Predictably, these conferences played out their role, resulting in the KGB revealing themselves even more, along with their tactics and hidden operation schemes. 
Thus, from this example, we see that the KGB uses the church as the first level of facade for all its activities. Furthermore, the results of our investigation have identified specific connections between individuals involved in discrediting campaign against Alatra. This revealed the KGB's second level of facade, anti-cult movements or anti-cult organizations. Let me clarify what they represent. The anti-cult movement is an extensive network of so-called anti-cult organizations in different countries around the world. They believe that they alone have the exclusive right to determine which of the world's religious and non-religious organizations are totalitarian sects or destructive cults. Representatives of anti-cult organizations are confident that they are the arbiters of public safety, deciding which of us, citizens of the democratic world, pose a threat to the well-being of society through the associations we create and join. The irony of the situation is that in their quest to protect us from so-called totalitarian dangers, anti-cult organizations themselves become instruments of totalitarianism, dictating to us what to believe and what not to believe. As a rule, anti-cult organizations and individual representatives of the anti-cult movement occupy strategic positions near power structures, influencing the religious and social narratives in various countries. In modern Russia, anti-cult organizations act as servants of the Russian Orthodox Church, playing a role of secular inquisition of the new century. These organizations and their key figures serve as a link between religious and secular authorities, including executive bodies, law enforcement agencies, and the judicial system. The KGB actively sought to introduce a similar anti-cult movement into American society, especially in the 1980s when KGB agents made special efforts to undermine American unity. However, as history shows, American democracy was able to withstand this challenge, repelling the attack and eliminating the influence of anti-cult organizations on its free territory, in contrast to Europe and post-Soviet states where their influence remains very strong and is growing. Along with this, the influence of the KGB is correspondingly growing. In Russia, the anti-cult center, which plays a vital role in the Russian Orthodox Church's fight against dissent, was founded in the year of 1993, as I mentioned earlier on. The time of the launch of the KGB's revanchist operation to destroy democracy the personality of the initiator and leader of this anti-cult organization in Russia is of particular interest. A thorough investigation into this person's biography revealed previous ties to the KGB and evidence of carrying out tasks that align more with those of a recruited agent rather than a natural researcher of religious cults. In the context of intelligence, it is worth noting the fact that this man was a disciple of a follower of George Gorgiev, a mysterious figure whose disciples, as we remember from history, were Stalin and Hitler. And we know what tragedies it ended in for humanity. Special attention should also be paid to information about the psychiatric diagnosis of this person, which sheds significant light on the reasons for such sophisticated methods of fighting dissent in the organizations entrusted to his leadership. Documents indicating that this person has cyclothymia, circular psychosis, pathological personality development, signs of sociopathy, suspicion of schizophrenia, and other mental disorders were made public and received wide media coverage. According to the conclusion of the psychiatric examination, this subject is unsuitable for public service and leadership roles in social movements due to his inability to demonstrate adequate levels of responsibility, subordination, and diligence. It was emphasized that the subject would not hesitate to make a decision of high importance, but it would be based on his personal, highly subjective views. It naturally raises the question, why does someone with a diagnosed mental disorder 
continue to hold leadership positions instead of being under mandatory treatment? Who benefits from having a mentally ill person occupy the role of the Chief Inquisitor of the Russian Federation? It is obvious that this individual with a confirmed psychiatric diagnosis but with grand Napoleonic ambitions was promptly recruited by the KGB and is being used as intended. I will note that it was this person who, in 1993, introduced the term totalitarian sect into the wide use and began methodically branding all organizations that were inconvenient for the Russian Orthodox Church with that label. For years, he sought the adoption of harsh measures against various religious organizations, initiating their persecution and harassment. His anti-cult organization has contributed to the demonization of Islam in the territory of Russian Federation. In fact, today, at the instigation of this person, a targeted campaign is being implemented to eradicate religious diversity in Russia and beyond. Even though it is contrary to democracy and can cause social conflicts, which is already noticeable in the context of the events currently taking place in Russia. Clearly behind the wide-ranging actions of the anti-cult gang lies a powerful force capable of ensuring impunity, despite the aggressive methods of its operation. An example of such impunity is the attempt by this anti-cult organization and its leader to recognize the essential book of Krishnaism, Bhagavad Gita, as it is, as extremist. The notion that the Bhagavad Gita can harm someone is ridiculous to those who understand what Krishnaism is. The attempt to give the book an extremist status led to massive anti-Russian protest in India and actually caused an international diplomatic scandal between India and Russia back in 2011 through 2012. Who benefits from such a vivid precedent of inciting interreligious hatred? I'm sure you already know the answer to this question. Paradoxically, despite the severity of the large-scale diplomatic conflict and the involvement of the foreign ministries of both countries in this process, all that was achieved was the removal of the extremist label that the anti-cultists tried to attach to the book of Krishnaism. Despite the seriousness of the incident, which caused the country's reputation to be undermined on the world stage, the representatives of the anti-cult group and their leader not only did not receive any punishment, but also continued to publicly condemn Krishnaism and its representatives without any consequences for themselves. Despite numerous lawsuits, the leader of this anti-cult group deftly evades criminal responsibility. He wins court cases even when the charges seem irrefutable. This indicates the presence of a shadow force and its certain influence on law enforcement agencies, judges, and prosecutors, and not only in this country. Representatives of Scientology, an international pro-democratic organization, have also been subjected to harassment in Russia. They sought to defend their rights through the European Court of Human Rights, but this also proved futile. It is important to note that the actions of the aforementioned person with an established psychiatric clinical evaluation have repeatedly caused alarm in academic circles as he contributes to the incitement of interconfessional hostility. Scientists, religious scholars, public and religious figures have repeatedly appealed to international leaders, Macron, Putin, Medvedev, Blinken, with a request to stop the actions of the anti-cult group and its leader, but to no avail. Their voices remained unheard. Despite criticism from the international community, the Russian Orthodox Church as an organization still supports the activities of the individual with an established clinical psychiatric condition and the inquisitional methods of his anti-cult organization. Even more, it honors him with high awards. However, not all representatives within the Russian Orthodox Church itself share these anti-human methods of harassing dissidents. Within the Church, the anti-cult movement and its leader are criticized for trying to monopolize Orthodox thought. 
for relying on discredited theories and non-canonical sources, and most importantly, for radical activities that result in hundreds of thousands of human lives being shattered with people and entire families suffering from stigmatization and persecution. This goes against true Christian values, and the clergy of the Russian Orthodox Church who expressed disagreement with his activities have repeatedly told this person about it. Moreover, they have repeatedly pointed out to him that the methods he and his organization use to fight dissidents contradict what is actually said in the Gospel. The leader of the anti-cult group admitted that he was aware of this, but at some point he realized that it was necessary to fight, and by any means available. In its essence, the anti-cult movement is a propaganda supervisory body waging a highly effective information war against unwanted secular and religious organizations throughout Russia and in many countries where its influence remains. As a result of the actions of the aforementioned person with a clinically diagnosed condition and his anti-cult group, Articles 14 and 29 of the Constitution of the Russian Federation have essentially ceased to exist, turning into a formality. These articles were supposed to guarantee that no religion can be established as a state religion, that all religions organizations are equal before the law, and that propaganda of religious superiority is prohibited. They proclaim that every citizen of Russia is guaranteed freedom of thought and speech, and that no one can be forced to renounce their beliefs. But now they no longer work, and the undermining of these basic fundamental human rights is a direct return to the totalitarian regime and tyranny. I want to ask you, Mr. Putin, has Russia gone back to 1937? Or is all this being done without your knowledge and you are not aware of what is happening in your country, which is multinational and multi-confessional? Don't get me wrong, I am in no way accusing the church now. The church is not to blame here, not even its satellite organizations, but those who use both of these structures behind your back to introduce their agents of influence. Or not behind your back, Mr. Putin. In this case, the victims of the KGB are the church, anti-cult organizations, Alatra, and many other organizations. The ones who have suffered the most from the KGB's operations on Russian territory are the ordinary citizens of Russia, for whom, thanks to the KGB's actions, the totalitarian regime becomes a harsher reality with each passing day. And who said that the KGB regards Russia as their country? Their country, their empire, is the Soviet Union, which has sunk into oblivion thanks to our actions. Judging by the events we are currently observing in Russia, the KGB Hydra, obsessed with revenge, is ready to sacrifice even this country and its citizens in pursuit of its ultimate goal. Therefore, I say that this organization has caused the greatest harm to Russians and Russia itself. Most concerning is the fact that the influence of this anti-cult gang and its leadership extends to democratic countries such as Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Denmark, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, the United States, and others. Moreover, he is still a member of the board of directors of a European anti-cult organization. This anti-cult structure serves as an umbrella organization for anti-cult associations from more than 30 countries. Its stated goal is to educate the public about sectarianism and protect victims of abuse by destructive religious cults. However, over its history, members of this umbrella organization have accumulated a significant number of civil lawsuits and criminal prosecutions for their actions. The activities of this organization violate fundamental international and constitutional rights of citizens, undermining the foundations of democracy. Yet this organization is based in the capital of a preeminent democratic country, Paris, and more than 90% of its funding is allocated by the French government from its taxpayers. It has participatory status with the Council of Europe and special consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, 
while continuing to conduct its clearly anti-human activities. This is at a time when the UN Charter itself emphasizes respect for fundamental freedoms and human rights, including freedom of religion. Also, I draw your attention to the fact that the activities of the aforementioned anti-cult organizations using anti-democratic totalitarian methods violate many provisions of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, such as Article 1, Article 2, Article 11, and Article 12, etc. In addition to the UN Declaration, the activities of the anti-cult organizations and their leadership violate fundamental constitutional human rights, as well as a number of international legal norms. The founder of the anti-cult movement in Europe called America's dedication to democracy, rights, and freedom a First Amendment neurosis. I think such a stance demonstrates, without further explanation, what kind of views the followers of anti-cult groups hold and what dangers they impose upon democracy. And here is the paradox. Despite all this, these organizations still exist to this day. And they not only exist, but are also sponsored at the expense of democratic states. How is such a thing possible in the free world? This is what the leaders of France will have to explain when the time comes. But from a logical standpoint, it is impossible to explain. It can only be explained by the interest and power of influence of the KGB. Or will you believe that behind all this stands one man diagnosed with circular psychosis who is pushing the interest of his religion and wants to make it dominant and titular? Dominant in Europe or dominant around the world? Why would he fight for influence in democratic countries? It is clear that this tainted man could not single-handedly create such a widespread network of influence agents. But this figure is very useful to those who stand behind him, the KGB Hydra. Interference in political processes, legislative activities, exerting influence on the judicial system, law enforcement agencies, and special services, influencing international politics, the ability to influence the decisions of heads of state, promoting and introducing totalitarian methods and narratives in democratic countries. All of this together exposes the interest of the KGB and all the schemes I have described above. Based on our investigation, it is now clear how deep and serious the interests of this KGB Hydra are, hiding behind the front cloaking organizations that have ruined many human lives, deprived hundreds of thousands of people of their reputation, dignity, and work, driven many people to suicide, and destroyed many families, all under the guise of the Russian Orthodox Church's interest. Is the Russian Orthodox Church really so powerful as to exert such influence on the democratic countries of the world? The Russian Orthodox Church itself is primarily a victim and a pawn in this game of the KGB. We merely observe the consequences of the influence of those who stand behind it. Their methods are the same both on the territory of Russia, controlled by the Russian Orthodox Church, and throughout the democratic world. During the investigation, there will be many questions for everyone involved in the case, especially for those covering up these organizations in the power structures of various states. This is not just a threat to democracy. This is a hidden war that is destroying our society from within. The scheme considered above is just one of the ways the KGB acts to recruit its agents, and a relatively harmless one. Because the KGB does not disdain anything in its strategy, they even use the terrorist attacks they themselves organize to then incite inter-ethnic strife in a country to which people will then demand a reaction from law enforcement agencies. However, such a reaction which will seem natural and logical to people, will in fact also be directed by the KGB Hydra. And as a consequence, at the request of people, people themselves are then deprived of their legitimate constitutional rights. Thus, democracy turns into a dictatorship, because of which people's discontent will increase 
and it will ultimately increase against the authorities and against the current regime. The KGB does not count human lives in achieving its goal. I am telling you this so that you understand what kind of information war is actually happening now. So that you understand that this is not a joke. This is war. If you decide to conduct an independent investigation and study the discrediting scheme using Elantra as an example, you will come to the interest of the Russian Orthodox Church and then to the concerns of the Chelyabinsk Diocese. And if you dig even deeper, you will come across a group of anti-cult organizations that harass the media, and in particular their leader with mental disorders who cannot even be held legally accountable. But this is all like catching a lizard by the tail. It would seem that you caught it, but the tail remains in your hands while the lizard escapes. Each level of the KGB's disguise is nothing more than a lizard's tail, which it can discard at any moment when it is no longer needed and hide in the shadows, remaining totally unnoticed. However, no matter how hard they tried to hide, we see them. And we have seen them from the very beginning. From the first steps towards the KGB's revenge, they thought that they were safe behind the scenes, but they failed to notice that they were standing on the side of the stage, brightly illuminated by the spotlights of truth, where we observe their every move. What you hear today is just a description of one example, one scheme of the KGB's actions within their grand revenge strategy. Their global tactic is to establish their control over the media space of our society. The KGB cast a wide net of precedent persecutions to catch those representatives of the media sphere who possess the characteristics the KGB needs, those who will be convenient for their manipulations. Through their agents, the KGB offers them the way to earn money easily by reprinting a slanderous article referring to someone who has already written something similar. Moreover, there is a pretext, the fight against an allegedly occult organization. They believe that responsibility for defamation, if anything, can be shifted to those who previously wrote about it. And in extreme cases, they can refer to the unintentional distortion of facts. The media representatives involved in writing and publishing discrediting materials about Alatra as part of the KGB's global strategy are essentially accomplices in their large-scale strategy to destroy the foundations of our society's democracy. Look again at the timeline of defamatory publications. It clearly shows how, with each new wave, the volume of materials increases, meaning the network of recruited agents who have conspired with the KGB is growing. Why do we assert this? We know how the KGB Hydra will exploit these recruited agents in the future. They are used for much more dangerous purposes than destroying an organization's reputation. At any moment, the KGB can sick their henchmen journalists, like their fighting dogs, against the necessary public figure, initiative, or party, against any politician, against any government, in any country. With collaborators in their arsenal in various media sectors in different countries worldwide, the KGB can control not only the masses' moods, but also events in the global geopolitical arena. By directing media narratives in the key necessary for their strategy, they can remove certain politicians from the arena, bring them back to the arena, put new ones in, arrange confrontations between them, and bring confusion to the economic, diplomatic, and geopolitical relations of countries. This is a multi-level refined game of the KGB, during which, as a shadow force, they exert their invisible influence on the geopolitical world landscape. And then we wonder, where do all these conflicts in the world come from? Why so much chaos? Why are there so many utterly illogical decisions and statements, as well as confusing geopolitical steps by key global politicians? The answer lies in the effortless exploitation of corrupt individuals who trade their honor and conscience, who dismiss democracy and freedom of speech, 
and who sell their children's future for 30 KGB pieces of silver, becoming collaborators. Through such people, the KGB octopus launches its tacticals into our consciousness, turning us into puppets whose actions ultimately contribute to the destruction of our nations. In the psychophysical laboratories of the KGB, an entire scheme has been developed for manipulating global events solely through the insertion of desired narratives into the media space. This manipulation is not easily noticeable at first glance. It occurs through seemingly insignificant shifts in the rhetoric of publications, television channels, media, platforms, and journalists who are part of their agent network. Moreover, the semantic shift in the narrative may go unnoticed even by the official owners of a particular media outlet who are convinced that they are the ones setting the tone of the narrative on their platforms. However, the KGB knows how to remain unnoticed and, through its agents, insert a specific message into a specific context in the media to evoke the desired thought and reaction, not just for the masses, but specifically from the target audience. And it knows how to direct this audience towards a specific target action. Of course, to detect such subtleties of information manipulation by the KGB, it is necessary to conduct an extremely detailed analysis. And I urge all those with a keen mind, analytical ability, and critical perception of information to do so. Let me give you some guidance on what to pay attention to. I'll explain using an example. If we take a journalist who participated in discriminatory campaigns against Alatra and carefully analyze their materials before and after this incident, we will discover some patterns. Firstly, there is a high probability that the materials published after the journalist recruitment will have non-standard or uncharacteristic formulations, phrases, and expressions. Sometimes it may be just one phrase per article, but it stands out from the overall rhetoric the journalist adhered to before this time. Secondly, it may be noticed that the journalist abruptly, without apparent reason, shifted to covering a certain topic that was not characteristic of their activities before. Such disruptions in rhetoric can occur shortly before and after the appearance of materials discrediting Alatra. Changes in the journalist's rhetoric may often concern political topics, but not always. Primarily the messages or narratives identifying influence from the KGB are associated with causing the reader viewer to doubt something or someone and to experience negative emotions such as outrage, indignation, pessimism, or aggression. However, undoubtedly, the KGB often utilizes recruited journalists and media platforms not only in such sophisticated tactics, but also in more direct political manipulations aimed at discrediting certain politicians, influencing elections in one country or another, or achieving other political changes necessary within the framework of a global strategy of revenge. A striking example of the KGB's use of its media agent network to influence political processes is the telling situation that unfolded in Ukraine in 2020. During the mayoral elections in Kyiv, we witnessed a concerted KGB operation to discredit one of the mayoral candidates, Ms. Irena Birashuk. As part of her pre-election campaign, Ms. Birashuk engaged in active media activities and gave numerous interviews to various sources, including the volunteer channel Alatra TV, a project of the Alatra organization. In this interview, she expressed a pro-Ukrainian and pro-democratic stance and demonstrated her readiness to serve the Ukrainian people. Using this interview as a pretext, KGB influence agents in the media began actively accusing Ms. Bereshuk of supporting pro-Russian views due to her participation in the Alatra TV interview. A mountain of similar defamatory articles descended upon the Ukrainian media space, where absurd labels such as active member of a pro-Russian sect sectarian, and worships the Putin sect were pinned on her. 
Since the topic of Russian aggression is extremely sensitive for Ukrainian society, such a discrediting campaign carried out by the hands of KGB influence agents played its role and led to a decline in her ratings. Thus, the capital of Ukraine did not get a mayor whose position would have been unequivocally unfavorable to the KGB's plans and would have threatened their interest. Otherwise, why would they invest resources and engage their influence agents in her discrediting? This is just one glaring example of the KGB's influence on elections in a democratic country aimed at steering the political processes of that country in the direction they desire. Furthermore, this example illustrates the aggressive and unfortunately effective methodology of discrediting developed by the KGB. If they were able to tarnish the reputation of such a clean and law-abiding organization as Alatra with their manipulative methods to the extent of using it as a scarecrow, then what can they do to the reputation of any other undesirable figure? even if it's the highest ranking official in the entire world. With such methods, they can turn his reputation from white to black, if his role no longer benefits the KGB. Moreover, they can do this in, to any politician in any country as their tentacles reach across the globe. You might think this is only possible in countries with weak, unstable democracies, but something like this can't happen in America you would be mistaken. I'll give you an example of how the KGB Hydra extended one of its tentacles into our country through a media campaign to discredit Alatra. The link that allowed the KGB to create new influence agents in America was an article from the British publication BBC News. This publication could have gone unnoticed and not caught our attention if it weren't for an incident that occurred in one of the cities in the United States and a glaring oversight made by the article's author, which led us to the KGB's trail in this matter. Let's go through it step by step. The journalist from BBC News and the author of the discrediting article about the Alatra organization portrays himself as an expert on climate misinformation and at first glance, based on his previous publications, appears to be a critic of totalitarianism. However, it's evident that when writing his article, he was clearly not acting in the interest of democracy. What revealed his true intentions and his potential secret backers? The thing is, this publication was dedicated to the climate issue, criticizing the activities of a lot of volunteers in informing the public about the growing climate threats. However, in the conclusion of the article, the author suddenly, without substantial arguments, shifts to a religious theme. And to provide readers with another characterization of Alatra, the article presents an unexpected opinion. It was the very concern of the Chelebinsk Diocese of the Russian Orthodox Church. Here the question arises from the very fact that the author of this article, a specialist in climate misinformation, who was preparing material on a topic that implies scientific and objective presentation, nevertheless refers to the opinion of religious figures from the Chelebinsk diocese about Alatra, where they characterize it as a psycho cult. Let's take a broader look at this situation. The fact is, this article was published in April of 2022 during a period of acute military conflict between Ukraine and Russia, where the democratic world stood in support of Ukraine. And here, a prestigious British publication releases an article during the height of this open political confrontation between the UK and Russia, citing the opinion of the Russian Chelebinsk diocese. Perhaps the BBC news journalist handlers forced him to make that reference. As for now, we don't know for sure, but the investigation will clarify this matter. However, in this situation, it's also interesting to note that even though the material contains several violations of journalistic principles and ethics, it was still cleared by the editorial team for publication. This circumstance provokes further thinking. 
If the blatant manipulative attribution about Alatra was solely the initiative of the article's author, it's unlikely that this material would have passed editorial scrutiny. The journalist couldn't have released the article without approval from the editor. This in turn may indicate that key individuals within the editorial team of the news organization who have the authority to publish materials were also subjected to bribery or recruitment by the KGB. It's not unlikely that high-ranking members of the publication's leadership are also involved in the operation. And if it weren't for one small addition at the end of the article, the creators of this dubious publication would likely not have been included in this investigation. Clearly this insertion referring to the concern of the Chalabis diocese was made to divert attention from the actual sponsors of the article. Specifically, the reference to the Russian Chelebis diocese, which had already conducted a campaign to discredit Alatra within Russia, and which the KGB used as their first level of disguise, points to the KGB as the ultimate beneficiary. From the perspective of the stated theme of the article, logic and simply common sense such an insertion by the author with an obvious intention to slander the Alatra organization is an explicable act. However, the article sponsors needed to distance themselves from any potential investigation by redirecting suspicion toward the Chelebis diocese. And their calculation paid off. This BBC News publication went unnoticed by the world's intelligence communities, by everyone except us. I'll note that this one-time operation could have cost the KGB significant resources. However, judging by the impact of this material's release, their investment likely paid off handsomely. The effectiveness of this article and the reason why it was emphasized lies in the fact that the publication of discrediting materials in a reputable outlet opens doors for further expansion of the network of influence agents. This KGB strategy proved successful, as clearly seen on the timeline, with a whole series of publications across Europe and beyond releasing a tremendous amount of material discrediting Alatra, citing BBC News as an authoritative source without verifying the information sources from the BBC article itself. And this had far-reaching consequences. Citing the article in BBC News, the KGB, through its influence agents, began to restrict the activities of Alatra volunteers in the democratic world. As a result, just one article in a well-known publication contributed to a significant expansion of the KGB's network of influence by recruiting a new army of collaborators from various media outlets, providing them with opportunity to operate in democratic countries and even stretch one of their tentacles into America, which became the most alarming event for us. Already in our country, disregarding democratic principles, the mayor of one city canceled a planned socially significant event organized by Alatra volunteers. The event was organized to inform the city's residents about safety measures during extreme weather events, Justifying the decision, the mayor referred to the BBC News article we mentioned earlier. In this striking precedent, we see how the mayor of an American city, a person holding a responsible government position, deprived his citizens of their legal rights, the right to freely disseminate and receive information, the right to peaceful assembly, and the right to freedom of speech. And most importantly, in the face of growing climate threat, he deprived his citizens of the opportunity to receive life-saving information. In other words, under the pressure of the authority of a British news organization, in the interest of the KGB, the mayor of an American city violated democratic principles and openly acted against the interests of the American people. He did that without any arguments other than the BBC article, which discusses the opinion of the Russian Chelyabinsk diocese. Moreover, the mayor didn't even respond to official requests from citizens of his city 
and civil organizations in which Americans asked him to explain the reasons for his actions. And it's clear why he didn't respond. He has nothing to say. But I have another question. Why hasn't this collaborator resigned yet? After all, the people elected him to defend democracy, not to work in the interest of the KGB, thereby facilitating their revenge. And besides, he set a precedent that will allow other KGB influence agents to act in our country similarly. And thus, conditions will be created where the constitutional rights of our citizens will continue to be violated. We are confident that the mayor mentioned above will eventually answer the question about the reasons for his actions. And not only this question, the cynicism of the situation lies in the fact that it was a British publication that influenced an American government official. The fact that Great Britain became the source of undermining the foundations of democracy in America is the pinnacle of cynicism from the KGB Hydra. Those of you who know history understand perfectly well that this is the KGB mocking us, and it worked. This is the KGB's favorite method, manipulating history. They revive outdated stereotypes about the relationship between two countries to activate them in the context of the present day. This breeds hostility and pits countries against each other, tearing them apart from within. And such vile tactics have long been a tool in the arsenal of those seeking to destroy the entire democratic world, the architects of consciousness. And we're certain that this incident was just the beginning. We believe these people would have fanned the spark they created into a global inferno if it weren't for our investigation, which puts an end to their further existence. You may wonder, is the democratic world in America doomed if the KGB can easily buy off all media and journalists? No, not all media is dishonest and not all journalists are ready to become traitors to their country and KGB agents. And this is another reason why the KGB is interested in prolonging and amplifying disinformation campaigns to identify the Judas journalist ready to sell out democracy for pennies Time is needed because they are the minority. The overwhelming majority of media professionals think critically about the information coming to them and value democracy as the foundation of their work. The minority are susceptible to bribery and corruption, but their voice can be so loud that at times they drown out the majority's voice. It's worth acknowledging that the KGB's narratives and manipulations have deeply embedded themselves in the minds of many people, and even among this overwhelming majority of upstanding journalists. That is why in our country today, we see defeatist rhetoric dominating. Now let's return to our investigation to provide another example of how the narratives of the KGB influenced the formation of public opinion in European democratic countries. In the media of Slovakia and the Czech Republic, including state-owned media, increasingly similar discrediting materials and pseudo-expert conclusions about Alatra have been appearing, portraying it as a supposed new religious cult by the same journalist. Meanwhile, several representatives from Slovak and Czech media actively referenced Ukrainian publications and each other in their articles. In other words, journalists from these two countries use similar rhetoric and demonizing narratives, place the same negative emphasis in their publications, and ask similar provocative questions to a lot of volunteers, all aimed at discrediting the organization in the eyes of the public. Part of this discrediting strategy also included baseless accusations of the organization's pro-Russian position. Corrupt journalists from local media outlets under the influence of the KGB deliberately ignored the facts of persecution and the banning of the Alatra organization in Russia, focusing instead their attention only on the situation in Ukraine. This clearly indicates that the media rhetoric was biased and served specific political goals. 
At the same time, just as in the case of Russia and Ukraine, anti-cult organizations participated in this information war against democracy in Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Moreover, they played a key role acting on the orders of a shadow force, the KGB, to destabilize the situation in the country and incite discontent among the population. For instance, Slovakia is not unfamiliar with the individual previously mentioned with the diagnosed psychiatric condition, you know, the anti-cult gang leader, who despite his mental state, enjoys unjustifiably high trust in academic circles at universities in that country. He was even awarded an honorary doctorate by one of them, partly for his alleged contribution to the so-called development of international relations. This fact directly indicates that these educational institutions are being used to train collaborationists and recruit new agents of influence for the KGB. This in turn is not just a troubling sign, but a direct threat to the foundations of democratic society and a serious warning signal for the country's intelligence agencies. In Slovakia, we also encountered a striking example of particularly cynical manipulation. The same local journalist citing a post on Facebook purportedly from the Slovak police began to assert that local law enforcement was warning people about a new dangerous sect. However, upon further investigation, it turned out that the post was made not by a police officer, but by a group administrator on their own initiative and did not reflect the official position of the police. Despite a request from Alatra volunteers to remove the unauthorized post for unknown reasons, it remained on social media page, casting a shadow on the police reputation. After all, how can the Slovak police violating the presumption of innocence publish accusations against anyone? This contradicts the very essence of police duty in a democratic society. Sure, just a trivial post on social media. But in reality, the seemingly minor detail spreading like a virus affects public opinion and allows KGB agents of influence in the press citing authority of law enforcement to exert psychological pressure on Alatra volunteers and tarnish the reputation of the entire Alatra organization. And when the police fail to take action against such little things, they play into the hands of the KGB, undermining the sovereignty of their country and allowing KGB agents to strengthen their influence within it. This is not trivial. This is national security. This is the security of all democratic countries. It is from such seemingly minor details deliberately created by collaborators that large-scale KGB attacks on democracy as a whole begin in pursuit of their revenge. It is essential to realize that in the KGB strategy, shaping public opinion is just a preparatory stage preceding more aggressive forceful actions. This stage involves not only engaging old proven KGB agents of influence, but also searching for new collaborationists within political, military, and law enforcement structures, and subsequently recruiting them. Allowing to illustrate the implementation of the forceful stage of the KGB strategy using the escalation of persecution against the Alatra organization as an example. As I mentioned earlier, in 2020, there was a sharp increase in disparaging publications about Alatra indicating a new infusion of funds for the deployment of a new phase of the persecution campaign. The heightened activity of collaborationists from the media, the intensified rhetoric, the use of disinformation tactics and provocations aimed at artificially inflaming tensions around the Alatra organization. All these factors clearly indicated how events would unfold further. Thus, we understood that Alatra would be drawn into the global game of the KGB by applying forceful suppression methods against it. We understood that the further unfolding of events would take place in the territory of three countries where the KGB's positions are strongest, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. And Ukraine would play a key role in this game 
serving as a bridge for the KGB's influence into the democratic countries of Europe. According to our intelligence data, Belarus was supposed to be the first country where the campaign against Alatra would escalate into an acute phase of forceful suppression. As we predicted, it was indeed from Belarus that the escalation of persecution against Alatra did begin. However, in practice, the situation in this country did not unfold according to the enemy's scenario. Thanks to the special attention of the President of the Republic of Belarus to the country's media landscape and the heightened vigilance of the state security services, the initial attempts by a shadow force to recruit journalists within Belarus media were unsuccessful. The only exceptions were a few internet resources where defamatory content against Alatra was published. However, this shadow force managed to enlist its influence agents within the Belarusian state law enforcement and executive bodies, eventually leading to a series of raids among Alatra volunteers and subsequent criminal prosecutions. Volunteers were subjected to multiple interrogations and psychological pressure from certain representatives of law enforcement agencies. Alatra organization members found themselves at risk, and it's hard to say how the events in Belarus would have unfolded if information about what had happened hadn't reached the country's president in time. In this situation, credit must be given to President Lukashenko as an experienced politician and strategist. Thanks to him, the persecution of innocent people was halted. By attempting to execute a forceful scenario, specifically in Belarus, this shadow force significantly exposed its agent network, subsequently allowing President Lukashenko to conduct a purge within the security structures, thereby neutralizing the actions of already implanted influence agents. This undoubtedly serves as a telling example for other countries that preventing the infiltration of enemy agents into the body of the state is possible if appropriate conditions are created and order is enforced. The next country where the forceful scenario of persecution was applied to the Alacha organization was Russia. The starting point in place where the entire theater of action unfolded was again the Chelyabinsk diocese. The events unfolded following the tested scheme that the KGB had frequently utilized through its agents of influence. Initially, a representative of the authorities would release an official statement expressing displeasure over the activities of a specific organization or individual. This would then be followed by a corresponding reaction from officials in the executive and law enforcement agencies, setting a precedence for the executive authorities to officially ban the organization. Typically in such KGB schemes, all participants are in a prearranged collusion and engage in actions that literally violate the lawful rights and interests of the targeted individuals or organizations. Here's an example of just how the scheme was applied to Alatra. In Russia, the transition of the campaign to discredit the Alatra organization into a phase of persecution began with the publication of the already known to you concerns of the Chelyabinsk diocese about the activities of the international organization Alantra. The statement from the church officials was swiftly picked up by secular media outlets, including those of national significance. Next, in response to the concerns of the Chelyabinsk diocese, a deputy of the State Duma from the Chelyabinsk region made a public statement that he had sent official requests to the law enforcement agencies and the Ministry of Justice with a request to investigate the situation around Elantra and take appropriate measures if necessary. After that, the state TV channel of Russia aired a high-profile video segment using the concerns of the Chelyabinsk diocese as a precedent, which served as a trigger for more extensive actions. Other media, including international ones, began to reference it. However, all these events were merely a prelude to their next move because mere statements from religious figures, one deputy, and the media buzz are insufficient to engaging in forceful methods. Therefore, within the territory of the influence of the Chelyabinsk diocese, 
An exemplary wrongful trial was conducted against one of the volunteers from the Awantra organization. I would like to shed more light on the issue of this judicial process so that you can better understand how KGB agents operate within their own country. By violating the constitution and laws of their own country, they seek to achieve their goals by any means necessary. This is important for understanding the whole picture. The trial was rife with a series of procedural violations. The crux of the matter is that the volunteer, as a member of Elantra, was charged without legal grounds with allegedly committing an administrative offense related to attention, illegal missionary activity. However, the international public movement Elantra is not a religious organization. Therefore, attaching the legal label illegal missionary activity to it is not possible. That is, the corpus delecti elements of the offense was absent from the beginning, which was also pointed out by the volunteer's attorney in court. Furthermore, the volunteer's counsel provided the court with a determination from the Institute of Forensic Expertise and Criminalistics in Moscow, stating that there was no evidence of religious or extremist tendencies in the activities of the Elantra organization. However, the judge unjustifiably refused to accept this determination as evidence. Instead, a letter reply from a specialist from the anti-cult organization led by the aforementioned individual with a psychiatric diagnosis was included in the case materials. In the letter it was stated that according to their specialist, Elantra allegedly exhibits traits of a religious cult. It is worth noting that this was merely the opinion of an individual from an online correspondence which cannot in any way be equated to an official expert determination. Nevertheless, the court deemed the letter reply more convincing than the determination of the competent authority, demonstrating the court's clear bias and prejudiced attitude toward the defendant. Furthermore, both a witness and representatives from the anti-cult group participated in this judicial process, all of whom conveniently happened to be associated with the leader of the anti cult movement in Russia, an individual with a confirmed psychiatric diagnosis. It's clear that this judicial process was nothing but a farce, and after a brief hearing, the volunteer was found guilty of an administrative offense and received a monetary fine. However, the significance here lies not in the punishment or the fine, the amount of which was not so significant. The entire purpose of this provincial proceeding, conducted with several procedural violations, was to establish a legal precedence whereby the international public organization, Elantra, was labeled as a religious organization associated with illegal missionary activity. What was the purpose of this for the agents of the KGB? It was to drag Elantra into the religious arena not only by labeling it a sect by church representatives, but also by making it one through an official court ruling. This in turn made it entirely vulnerable to the laws of the totalitarian state. Sometime after these events, the General Prosecutor's Office of Russia declared Alatra an undesirable organization on the territory of the Russian Federation thereby blocking any further activities of the organization in the country. In effect, this led to the closure of the organization in Russia. During the investigations, a lot of volunteers were subjected to numerous interrogations during which psychological violence tactics were applied. The interrogations were conducted aggressively, lasting for several hours at a time. People were intimidated, humiliated, threatened and pressured to their breaking points. After such moral torture, individuals had to recover for weeks. After the official recognition of the organization Elantra as undesirable, a series of administrative and criminal legal proceedings were initiated, incriminating the dissemination of materials from an undesirable organization and cooperation with an undesirable organization. 
Now, if a person sends a private message with a link to a video related to a launch's activities, imagine that friend, that person may face significant fines and imprisonment for up to four years. And this is in a country whose information space increasingly echoes narratives that their democracy is the true democracy and the best democracy in the world. The closure of Elantra in Russia left its participants with only three options. Either renounce their beliefs and cease all activities entirely, immigrate to a democratic country where they can continue to participate in Elantra projects, or face imprisonment. Immediately after the closure of the Elantra organization in Russia, its active members filed a counterclaim in court against the Prosecutor General's office. They made a completely legitimate request for the Prosecutor General's office to provide the grounds for the decision to include Alatra in the list of banned organizations. However, despite many months passing, the Russian Prosecutor General's office has still not provided the basis for the decision and has not satisfied any request for access to the materials on which the decision was based. This is despite the fact that all requests came from persons legally entitled and authorized to receive these materials from the Prosecutor General's office. Do you know why the justifications still haven't been provided to the Alatra volunteers? Because they do not exist. This shadow force, the KGB Hydra, has created public resonance and set a court precedence by imposing an official ban on Alatra. This has made even those not involved in their network hostage to the situation within the federal system of government bodies. Now they must find ways to justify all the actions taken by KGB agents of influence, thriving within political and law enforcement structures. At present, the only possible way for KGB collaborationists to justify their illegal actions is to accuse those with whom they unjustly condemned and banished. Otherwise, in the eyes of the people, their actions will be no different from repression. But it's important to note that even this Hydra sometimes makes mistakes. And now, through the KGB mouthpieces they typically use to spread lies, you can hear them slip up and reveal their future plans. For example, in a recent interview, the vice president and current board member of the mentioned anti coal group said that merely declaring the Atlanta movement undesirable in Russia is not enough. According to him, it should be equated, in his words, to an extremist and terrorist organization. These are their further plans for Alatra, and it won't be surprising if we soon see further steps in their implementation in the form of new official statements by officials and attempts to enshrine them at the legislative level. But it's worth noting that the very fact of such a statement indicates that the Alatra organization has no relation to what they want to accuse it of. And the artificial attempt to link extremism to Elantra once again serves as a confirmation of the deliberate and cynical crime of the KGB collaborationist. Such leakage of instructions through the interview of their inept agent essentially exposes the KGB's further plans. If you observe closely, you can see that such slip-ups by the KGB happen quite often. It's enough to listen attentively to what their agents say. As you can see, they are actually afraid to think for themselves and simply replay what they were ordered to do. And here arises the question, who could have instructed them to link Elantra to extremism and terrorism? And where does this rhetoric come from? which they then mindlessly transmit. Does it come from the clergy serving God or from the KGB agents? And the main question is, what was all this done for in the very first place? Years of information warfare against Elantra with substantial financial investments and human resources, was all this just to close one volunteer organization? I doubt it. 
Defeating a launcher in this case is like a professional boxer beating up a baby in the ring. What changed in the country after Alatra was expelled? I'll tell you. Alatra is gone, but the KGB's network in Russia has only strengthened even more. And now they have even more significant influence over the government apparatus, political processes, and control of public opinion in this country. And what a surprise. Completely by chance, shortly after the decision of the Prosecutor General's office to expel Elantra, the Prosecutor General of the Russian Federation, whose deputy carried out the closure of Elantra, albeit under a call from the presidential administration, received a very well-deserved award, a medal. The presentation of this award took place in a special atmosphere. I want to show you this video now so that you can see it for yourselves. But first, let me add, this little medal placed on this man's chest is the price of Russia's freedom. The Russian people, their freedom and the constitutional rights they were sold for one dinky medal. And President Putin appointed this person to this position personally, which means the responsibility for everything this person has done lies wholly with him. I don't know if President Putin personally had a hand in the decision to expel Elantra or not. It's unlikely that, as an intelligent person, he would act against people violating constitutional rights, of which he himself is the guarantor. You know, I've worked with four U.S. presidents in my lifetime, and I know very well how information reaches them through the people they trust. Therefore, I cannot rule out the possibility that the voice of this shadow force may be speaking through the mouths of those surrounding the president and remain unnoticed by Mr. Putin himself. Now I'll show you a video that indirectly shows who is actually invisibly standing behind the backs of those who, wielding power, unjustly decide people's fates through the unjust courts. Генеральный прокурор Российской Федерации удостаивается ордена Русской Православной Церкви благоверного князя Александра Невского второй степени. Достоин, 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 достоин. I want to tell you, Mr. Putin, that once the predecessors of these people crucified Christ. They were the ones who instigated people to shout to Christ himself, guilty, guilty. They compelled people to cry out to Pontius Pilate, crucify, crucify. And now their successors stand behind the backs of those who sing, worthy, worthy. These are the ones standing behind your back, Mr. Putin. And what people will shout next time is something you should truly think about. Perhaps I will provide another illustrative example upon hearing which you will be able to understand who truly holds sway in Russia. This example concerns an international religious organization that faces persecution within Russia, namely Jehovah's Witnesses. I will take the time to describe some details of the situation surrounding Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia so that you grasp more vividly the point we are endeavoring to convey to you. As far back as 2017, the Russian Supreme Court deemed the activities of the Administrative Center of Jehovah's Witnesses extremist, ordering the center and all its branches to be eliminated and banned within the borders of Russia. Nevertheless, numerous individuals, Russian citizens, resolved to remain faithful to their religious beliefs and did not renounce them. For this, they continued to face criminal prosecution and imprisonment at the hands of the state. By an already understandable coincidence, among the instigators and active participants in the persecution of believers of this organization are representatives of the Russian Orthodox Church representatives of the anti-cult organizations loyal to them and directly their leader. 
What's noteworthy is that the campaign of persecution against Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia is so severe that some analysts liken it to repression, characterizing the events not merely as attempts at suppression, but as deliberate actions aimed at the complete eradication of this organization from Russian territory. There's a twist in these events. After some time following the Russian Supreme Court's declaration of Jehovah's Witnesses' activities as extremists, these events were commented on by the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin himself, during a meeting of the Presidential Council on Human Rights. Mr. Putin dismissed the accusations of extremism against Jehovah's Witnesses as complete nonsense, stating that Jehovah's Witnesses are also Christians and expressing his lack of understanding as to why they should be persecuted. Furthermore, at the same meeting, Putin stated that he does not recommend categorizing representatives of religious communities as members of any destructive, let alone terrorist, organizations. He emphasized the need to be much more liberal towards representatives of various religious sects. And notably, he called for a careful examination of this matter. However, for some reason, nobody seemed to heed the words of the president of Russia himself, the guarantor of the constitution and constitutional rights. And the campaign of persecution against Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia continues actively unabated to this very day. Followers of this organization continue to fight for their rights appealing to international bodies in the hope that they will help defend their constitutional and human rights. For example, sometime back in 2022, the European Court of Human Rights deemed the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia unlawful. However, since the recent amendments to the Russian Constitution in 2020, decisions of international bodies are no longer considered a priority for implementation within Russian territory. According to the new amendments, priority is given to the Russian constitution over international legislation and treaties. But as you already know from the specific examples I have provided today, nobody there has been considering the Russian constitution for a very long time, just as evidently not heeding the opinion of President Putin. After President Putin's statements, many followers of Jehovah's Witnesses harbored the hope that their president would be able to help them. But he couldn't. They hoped that following the president's remarks, law enforcement agencies would at least release from prison their fellow believers who had committed no crimes but simply read the Bible. But this did not happen. Despite the president's statements, persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses continued unabated, just as before. The question arises, why did President Putin's words remain just words? And here, there are only two possible answers. The first is that President Putin genuinely wanted to understand what was happening and help these people, but upon encountering forces within his country much greater than himself, he could not oppose them and therefore could not influence the situation. In this case, it appears that President Putin does not wield the power in Russia that the people endow him with. And this in turn means that there is a shadow force behind him pulling the strings. But what is this force that manipulates President Putin himself? Is it the church or anti-cult organization striving to make orthodoxy the dominant religion almost worldwide? Or is it indeed that shadow force behind them all? The force that brought Putin to power. If this is not the case, then the second scenario would require acknowledging that during his statements, President Putin simply lied to his people who elected him. This means President Putin's words diverge from his true intentions and actions and hold no weight. The statement of this entire situation is that in both cases, it turns out that President Putin, consciously or not, is an accomplice of the KGB and does not serve as a guarantor of the Constitution for his people. 
This only means one thing. Putin is not the Grand Master. He is simply merely a pawn on the global chessboard played by the KGB. The last and most crucial question remains. Mr. Putin, who truly holds power in Russia? Is it you or the KGB? Are you consciously colluding with them or are they manipulating you without your knowledge? Are you in the game or are you being played? You don't have to answer me. Just answer your people. Let's return to our investigation. Just a few months after Alatra was expelled from Russia, a similar tactic of persecution was applied in Ukraine. However, while the practice of persecuting and eradicating undesirable organizations under the guise of combating religious dissent had become commonplace in Russia, for the territories of independent Ukraine currently fighting for democracy, such a campaign was an exceptional event. Nevertheless, considering the KGB's high stakes in Ukraine, they could not afford any mistakes here, so the methods employed were much harsher and more unprincipled. The KGB had spent many years' efforts and resources shaping a sharply negative public opinion about Alatra. By the time the escalation of events began, the campaign to discredit Alatra in Ukraine had been ongoing for about 10 years. Through collaborationists in the media, a demonized image of Alatra as a pro-Russian sect was actively imposed on the information field of the country. Therefore, when the semblance of negative public opinion had already been created, the last step remained before the KGB began its forceful actions. In Ukraine, following the same pattern as in Russia, the coercive phase of persecution began with a statement from a deputy expressing concern about the activities of a Lacha organization. Subsequently, KGB influence agents from the prosecutor general's office took control of the case, citing a request from the same deputy. After the statement from the deputy and the intervention of the prosecutor general's office, the implementation of the plan to suppress the activities of the Alatra organization with the use of forceful methods on the territory of Ukraine commenced. As our analysts predicted, the most severe scenario of persecution against Alatra unfolded precisely here in Ukraine. Counterintelligence operations by the Security Service of Ukraine, SBU, in conjunction with the National Police of Ukraine, conducted a massive raid across the country. Representatives of law enforcement agencies carried out around 70 searches in the offices and homes of Alatra volunteers in just one day, confiscating work and personal computers, mobile phones, hard drives, video cameras, and other equipment necessary for video recording, as well as books, printed materials, bearing the logos of the movement, and even personal photos and diaries. Significant resources of the SBU were expended to conduct an operation of such a scale, and it is evident that its preparation took months. Likely, the decision to employ forceful methods and suppress the activities of the Alatra organization was made shortly after the official ban of this organization in Russia. Under the conditions of martial law, KGB agents employed the most severe and cynical tactics against participants of the Alantra organization. Considering the long-term baseless rhetoric that this organization is supported and financed by the aggressor country, they attempted to incriminate Alantra volunteers with aiding the enemy, which falls under the article of treason. However, since the Alantra organization and its volunteers were actually law-abiding, and did not commit such crimes, the KGB agent's gamble was to find something during the searches that could be linked to the preconceived accusations. Therefore, as evidence of the alleged pro-Russian stance of Ukrainian Alacha volunteers, utterly absurd items were presented in the media. For example, props and requisites for filming volunteers' blogs even reached the point where, during the searches, the personal savings of one of the organization's volunteers, a pensioner woman, were confiscated, later portrayed in the media as Kremlin money. As a result of the searches, 
Several members of the Elantra organization were charged with treason, creating a criminal organization and managing it, propagating a communist totalitarian regime and justifying and denying Russia's armed aggression against Ukraine. These same individuals were accused of aiding the enemy in subversive activities and threatening the information security of their country. Fortunately, Ukraine is a democratic country where the death penalty has been abolished. Otherwise, during the wartime, all these people would have faced execution, as was the case in 1937 during the Soviet era. Can you imagine the tragedy of the situation on the one hand and the utmost cynicism and depravity of the KGB and their influence agents on the other? Innocent people being framed for execution. Even those who were not charged faced intense psychological pressure as they found themselves under the powerful influence of public opinion. The country's mainstream media outlets disseminated news of the searches conducted on Alatra participants and the charges brought against them, repeating the same KGB narratives that Alatra was allegedly a dangerous and destructive sect engaged in subversive activities within the country, portraying its members as traitors to the homeland and collaborators with the enemy. People who found themselves in cruel social isolation became objects of contempt, even from their relatives. Some faced merciless dismissal from their jobs, leaving them literally without a means of survival in such challenging times. Just imagine what a person goes through in this situation, completely innocent, yet unable to prove their innocence. And all the while, they were accused of ties with an enemy from whom they have suffered greatly, like all their fellow countrymen. An enemy who is tearing apart their country. Indeed, many Alatra participants themselves suffered during missile attacks on Ukrainian cities, and many lost their homes. Many had to survive under artillery shelling in Bucha. Some were under siege by the enemy in Mariupol and others to this day are in the midst of active combat where every day could be their very last day. And many Alatra volunteers have already died in this war. For many, this war has taken the lives of their loved ones and people very dear to them. And after all this, they are accused of betraying their country and their people. Can you just imagine being in their place? During times of war, when everyone around you sees you as a traitor, when even close relatives, at best, begin to avoid you and, at worst, hate you and spit in your face, such an accusation is akin to a death sentence. Absolutely innocent people are morally crucified, and they are crucified primarily in the minds of others by the real collaborationists from the mass media and government authorities. This is how the KGB operates, harshly, cynically, absolutely unprincipled, absurdly, without any shame. This is how they destroy truth, freedom, and justice. This is how they destroy democracy. Let's return to the current situation with the Alatra volunteers in Ukraine. In this situation, KGB agents face certain difficulties, I would even say a rather insurmountable task. Before them arose the question, how to condemn innocent people without having any evidence of their guilt? Because even the most dishonest corrupt judge or prosecutor, the most loyal KGB agent, no matter how hard they try, cannot hand down a life sentence without nothing but props as evidence. Five months after the start of the pretrial investigation, the same deputy who initiated the forceful stage of persecution against Alatra published a new statement on her social media page. In this statement, she sharply criticizes the investigative and judicial bodies, claiming that the case is still only at the preliminary investigation stage and that a decision to detain Alatra volunteers has not yet been made. This is not just a request to look into it, but a specific demand to imprison the innocent as soon as possible. Instead of waiting for a fair court decision, 
she uses her official position to openly pressure the investigative and judicial bodies. Such actions indicate the apparent bias of this official who spreads KGB narratives, thus acting not in the interest of her country. This rhetoric is typical of a collaborationist under the guise of false patriotism. The question arises, why does the USA continue to finance a country whose authorities blatantly promote undemocratic narratives and use their official position as a tool of pressure to imprison the undesired and disband the organization? Why should such actions by Ukrainian authorities be paid for out of the pockets of the American taxpayer? Of course, these collaborationists began to artificially fabricate cases against honest, innocent people, relying on rumors and negative images from articles they themselves invented. Fabricating cases is their favorite tactic. 2,000 years ago, those whom the KGB today considers their teachers used this tactic to conduct the most unjust trial in the history of humanity, the trial of Jesus Christ. The same methods used against the volunteers of Alatra were used against Jesus. And now you will see it yourself. First, Jesus, like the volunteers of Alatra, was discredited in the eyes of society by spreading defamatory and false information about him. Following their arrest, both Jesus and the Alatra volunteers were initially accused of illegal missionary activity, and then to maximize the severity of the punishment, they were accused of treason. I hope you notice that both the KGB and their historical predecessors act identically. All of this has proven effective methods that have been finally honed over 2,000 years. When Jesus was crucified for all these false accusations, a huge crowd watched. The majority whose minds had been manipulated beforehand cried out, crucify him. Those who had considered themselves friends of Jesus earlier denied him and silently watched his agonizing death from afar, and only a few stood up for him. But there were too few of them. Today our democracy is being crucified. Freedom, equality, and human rights, all that our founding fathers created, preserved, and passed down to us with immense love and incredible effort. Today all of this is ruthlessly exterminated by the KGB. The crowd that has embraced the KGB's narratives supports this execution, while some people simply watch the crucifixion of democracy silently and indifferently. And it is precisely the volunteers of Elantra who defend it. These wonderful people have not betrayed their principles even during the harshest persecutions and humiliations that have lasted for 10 years. Thanks to their patience, compassion, and democratic values, today we have the opportunity to expose the sinister schemes of the KGB. The fact that the Elantra volunteers did not give up is what allows me to tell you the truth now. Although it took them 10 years to endure this, think about this number. Remember what they have experienced and are experiencing now. And think, would you withstand such pressure? The volunteers did not surrender, did not disown, and did not abandon the Alatra flag. They deserve to be remembered by all generations. So forgive me, Alatra volunteers, but I believe that this flag, the Alatra flag, should become the universal symbol of democratic values and freedom. Therefore, I, Agon Chalakian, have defended democracy and human freedom all my life and I will continue to do so until my heart stops beating. And from this moment, the moment of my direct and open statement, the Alatra flag becomes a symbol of freedom and democracy for every free person who values democracy. I understand that you may have a logical question. Why are so many good, honest people, participants of Elantra and this pure and beautiful organization itself being led to the slaughter like lambs. What is the point? I'll answer. The point is not to punish people or banish Elantra. Persecutions against Elantra and the events in Ukraine are just a means, a tactical move to achieve the KGB's more global goal, revenge. 
So, why did the KGB need to spend so much money, allocate so many resources, and try to orchestrate all this with Alatra in Ukraine? The answer is quite simple, because Ukraine is a bridge, a bridge to democratic countries by conducting a discrediting media campaign against Alatra in Ukraine, through which they enlisted all the rejects of Ukrainian journalism into their service, their plan is to gather among journalists a similar harvest of sellout collaborationist scum in European democratic countries as well. For this purpose, Ukraine plays the role of a bridge. Since the start of military actions, the entire democratic world has sided with Ukraine. Accordingly, the narratives dominant within the country are supported and accepted. By conducting a demonstrative information attack on the Alatra movement in Ukraine, they thereby pave the way for penetration into European countries as well through a similar attack. We understood perfectly well that after achieving success in Ukraine, the KGB would start creating new footholds in other democratic countries to conduct a full-scale attack on democracy. And now we are already witnessing how they, through a campaign to discredit Alatra, are actively conducting ideological preparation in practically all democratic countries where all the KGB narratives they apply in Ukraine are already heard in Europe. Meanwhile, the fact that Russia was the first to initiate repressions against Alatra is wholly ignored. It was in this country that trampling all the foundations of democracy, the authorities first enacted a complete ban on it. As we understand, the main bridge that the KGB is currently extending from Ukraine is aimed towards the Czech Republic or Slovakia, where the KGB Hydra is presently launching a massive attack on the press. The goal is to recruit new agents of influence and create an appearance of public concern regarding the activities of the Alacha organization through the media. We predict that soon in one of these countries, either the Czech Republic or Slovakia, the KGB will attempt to conduct a forceful attack on Elantra. Based on the experience of the strategy applied in Russia and Ukraine, we expect that soon in one of these countries, the Czech Republic or Slovakia, we will hear expressions of concern from a local deputy or other official. Subsequently, the adversary will move to the coercive stage of the operation, followed by the prohibition of the Alatra organization at the state level and its expulsion from the country. And even if we manage to prevent the development of this scenario in the Czech Republic or Slovakia, it does not mean that the KGB will not resume attempts in other democratic countries in Europe. If the KGB Hydra succeeds in implementing its plans fully in one of the democratic countries in Europe, it will set a serious precedence, and then other countries will fall at the feet of the KGB like dominoes. This is why the KGB orchestrated the persecution of Alatra, to create a whole army of collaborationists in the media, law enforcement agencies, and government bodies, which they could then activate at the right moment for their revenge. That is the ultimate goal behind the slaughter of this Alatra lamb by the KGB. It's a sacrifice for entering democratic countries to achieve the main goal, America. And then the tentacles of this hydra will be able to reach the neck of the last bastion of democracy. And then the KGB will get its revenge. The greatest irony of the situation, which demonstrates the audacity and impunity of the KGB hydra, is that this entire operation to undermine democratic freedoms in Ukraine was conducted for a long time with our money, American money. Indeed, by supporting Ukraine and financially assisting Ukrainian security and militarized structures in the struggle for democracy, we were simultaneously financing the embedded agents that the KGB Hydra uses for directly opposite purposes. This is a precise and calculated plan by the KGB, and therein lies their greatest cynicism to set up the game in such a way that by supporting those who are fighting for democracy, we are actually financing those who are destroying democracy. 
They're embedded agents who covertly operate behind Mr. Zelensky's back, have already seriously undermined the reputation of Ukraine security forces in democratic countries, including the United States. They have also sabotaged numerous positive initiatives of President Zelensky himself and significantly tarnished the president's image, undermining trust in him both domestically and internationally. These are the true collaborationists serving the KGB, and they are the real enemies of Ukraine. Now I will draw a parallel that may not be obvious to many, but it is logical and connected to all the events I've mentioned. The thing is, in Ukraine, before the searches and persecution of Elantra began, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate underwent similar actions by the Ukrainian security forces. So those who initiated the persecution of Elantra are now facing similar persecution in Ukraine. How did this happen? And why has no one thought about it? In reality, they are creating the image of a victim from the Russian Orthodox Church. Imagine what will happen at the end of the war. This victim, the Russian Orthodox Church, will not just return to the country, but will return as a much suffering and unjustly persecuted entity. And just how do you think this will end? It will end with the Moscow Patriarchate becoming the titular religion in Ukraine, the full-fledged mistress of the country. But that's not their entire plan regarding the territories of Ukraine. Right now, the global community is convinced that the persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church is happening with the permission or even the direct order of President Zelensky. By shifting the blame onto him, they are thereby creating additional conditions for further conflict between Jews and Christians. Now let me ask you, what do you think will happen to the Jews in post-war Ukraine when the Russian Orthodox Church returns as a titular religion with its Inquisition? I'll tell you, it will be similar to what is happening with the Muslims in Russia, particularly with the Tajiks. And such destructive thought patterns are already entrenched in the minds of Ukrainians. This is how the architects of consciousness operate. As for Russia, the Moscow Patriarchate of the Orthodox Church is already becoming the titular religion there, which is being done quite demonstratively. Pay attention. Who is practically always present either next to Putin or in the front rows at important state gatherings? Do you see representatives of all religions next to Putin or just one? And where are the leaders of other religions? The Russian constitution states that all religions should be separate from the state. But in reality, all are separate, except one. Notice how while the church and its anti-cult group brand others as a totalitarian sect, they are creating their own totalitarian religion. Mr. Putin, I understand that the image of religion as one of the main instruments of power has been instilled in your consciousness, but you also know history very well. And you must remember that throughout history, power was not only strengthened through religion, but also overthrown through it, replacing kings, queens, and empires. So think, Mr. Putin, who exactly instilled in you the image of the necessity of a titular religion? And the same titular religion is what they want to implant in Ukraine when the war ends. But you may wonder, how do they know the war's outcome? I'll answer you because the true and ultimate beneficiary of the war between Ukraine and Russia is the Hydra of the KGB, which has drawn everyone into this conflict, splitting the world in half. Why? Well, I'll tell you. A fight in the yard is needed so that everyone looks out into the yard and doesn't notice that the father of the family is being murdered in the back bedroom of the house at the same time. Fellow Americans, now you see the global picture of the world. When you free yourself from imposing images, you begin to see the truth. And now you understand who the conductors are behind everything happening in the world, sometimes inexplicably. The KGB is the shadow force that is never seen. 
Driven by their thirst for revenge, the KGB does not even spare their own states. And if they don't care about their own territories, just imagine what will happen to America and other countries. The threat hanging over America and Americans is grave indeed. This Hydra reaches out to us and devours everything in its path. Think how the KGB will treat the people of other countries if they are so cruel to their own citizens. And how will they retreat us, the direct targets of their vengeance? And notice, throughout all this, the enemy has not taken a single action with their own hands. Not a single word has been spoken directly from them. All was done by the hands of other people and organizations to reach their tentacles directly into the heart of our democracy. And the heart of our democracy, that's you and me, and above all, our thoughts. It is precisely there that the enemy seeks to infiltrate and sow chaos and disorder, to demotivate and morally exhaust us. Because it is our thoughts and images that shape our reality, therefore the creation of a negative image is the keystone on which the entire strategy of the KGB's information war against democracy is built. Artificially implanted images can completely change a person's worldview distort reality and replace truth with lies. The principle behind destructive images and narratives is straightforward. When a ready-made negative image is implanted into a person's consciousness, whether regarding an organization, a political party, or their own country, such negative images are typically accepted by the mind without critical evaluation. This is because they trigger deep-seated fears and concerns in individuals such as fear for oneself, one's future, which in turn evoke numerous doubts and anxieties. It is these emotions that signal that the artificially implanted image has begun its destructive action. All these images are linked to the instinct of survival inherent in each of you. Everyone is hearing now about how our world is on the brink of nuclear war. This narrative is actively fueled by the very shadow force that, through its proxies, implants the necessary images into the consciousness of a vast number of people. But why are people so actively artificially forced to adopt such a scenario? Because if this image enters the consciousness bypassing critical thinking, then the individual begins to perceive it as their own idea and then that person internally becomes prepared, accepting that nuclear war could indeed happen. So, they agree with this scenario. And here arises the question, what if this person is the head of a state? If, for example, the president of a country accepts such an image and makes a public statement that they are prepared for nuclear war, then this will inevitably trigger a wave of fear among people, further reinforcing the images already implanted in their minds. Consequently, a vast number of people, the entire country perhaps, will not only be morally prepared to start a nuclear war, but out of fear of being annihilated first, they will ask their president to launch a preemptive strike against the enemy indicated by the KGB. The architects of consciousness act through destructive images like a deadly virus gradually infecting every cell of the living organism, killing it from within. All this is happening right before our eyes, and even more so through us ourselves. The battlefield here is not a geographical space, but a consciousness of each individual. And now the question of what is more effective? direct military confrontation or the struggle for people's minds becomes rhetorical. Look at the example of Alatra. How much money has been invested in the campaign against it? According to our data, the KGB apparatus has spent over $200 million over the past decade to discredit this international public organization. At first glance, it seems like a large sum to defame an innocent volunteer organization. But if you think about how many agents have been recruited and the damage already inflicted on America and democracy as a whole, and consider the army of agents they have formed during this struggle, then this amount is peanuts. 
For comparison, the amount spent on discrediting Elantra is equivalent to the cost of only 100 combat missiles. Yes, this is a sizable amount, and it could influence the course of a battle, but not the entire war. At the same time, the same amount spent on expanding the network of influence agents in the media, political circles, law enforcement agencies, and among opinion leaders significantly contributes to the strengthening of the KGB's positions and bringing them closer to victory. That's why the information warfare currently being waged by the KGB Hydra against democracy is much more advantageous, effective, and dangerous than traditional armed confrontation. And Elantra is just one organization. Imagine how many more there are that the KGB uses for its purposes. Now you understand which is more effective, open confrontation or small, unnoticed, but deadly information virus that gradually infects and kills the host body from within, which may not even know about it until its last breath. That's why the KGB acts through our consciousness, and that's why the most effective and destructive weapon in this war is the destructive images artificially implanted in people's minds. The entire strength of the KGB lies in their secrecy. Until today, they have been operating in the shadows, and everything they did went unnoticed by the world's intelligence agencies. But they didn't know that we were watching them closely. And at this moment, when they think they are closer to revenge than ever, they are actually suffering defeat. Because right now, their plans have been exposed and revealed. Today, we have presented to you just one example from the multitude demonstrating the methods by which the KGB seeks to undermine democracy in America and thus destroy it worldwide. The Alatra case is just the tip of the iceberg of numerous and long-lasting KGB operations conducted in the shadows, remaining unnoticed by intelligence communities and security services worldwide. And what I have revealed today is just a drop in the ocean of everything they continue to do to achieve their revenge. Behind many past and present wars and confrontations between countries stands precisely the surviving super secret part of the KGB structure. It is this organization that is pushing the world towards nuclear war today. And they don't care that this war could destroy everyone and everything. Their hatred and thirst for revenge are boundless. In their quest to destroy democracy and get their revenge, they will stop at absolutely nothing, even if it means destroying the whole world. The KGB does not seek to restore its empire. They aim to destroy the world that once destroyed their empire. In 1991, when the Soviet Union was dissolved without a single shot fired by the efforts of the U.S. intelligence services, this faction of the KGB felt insulted and deeply humiliated before the entire world. It was a catastrophic blow to their pride and ego. Therefore, today, they are obsessed with the goal of destroying the source of their deep humiliation, the United States of America. Our world is already headed towards totalitarianism. If the actions of the KGB are not stopped, their influence on societal processes worldwide will be catastrophically increased with each passing year. I remind you, while these elections in the United States proceed relatively smooth with moderate KGB influence, the next elections will be entirely under KGB control. And 2028 will be the last year of democracy. The KGB will install a leader of America who is completely under their control and who will initiate what seems to be a natural occurrence of civil war in America. The seeds of this war are being sown in you right through the narratives of KGB agents in the media, in mass culture, and through the calls of public figures. Aren't we hearing messages in the American information space today that would have seemed unthinkable even 10 to 20 years ago? Declining America, divided America, national divorce, dying democracy, decaying America, and so on. 
Each of these messages is a bomb. A bomb dropped by the KGB into the heart of our nation. These bombs are flying at us now at an enormous frequency and they are more destructive than any ballistic missile because they target not our homes, not our businesses, not our bridges. These bombs target what was built long before us by our founding fathers, the ideological foundation of America. Please remember what I mentioned at the beginning of my address. Sociological surveys indicate that America is currently experiencing a crisis of patriotism and psychologically our nation today resembles a society that has lost a war. Now you understand why. Because the war is already underway. It's the KGB's war against us. And so far, we are losing it by allowing the images imposed by the KGB into our consciousness. Images of a declining and worthless America. Fellow Americans, I want you to clearly realize how monstrous the implementation of their plan would be. The United States is the bastion of global democracy and its true strength lies in the hearts of Americans. Democracy is not only embodied in documents, it lives in the soul of every citizen of the United States. And the downfall of democracy in America would mean its end worldwide. Understand, the KGB's goal is not simply to harm us, humiliate us, or weaken us. Their goal is to destroy us, first morally and then physically. And they do it with our own hands, divided, torn apart by civil war, drenched in the blood of her sons and daughters. This will become our America. On the ruins of our nation, either total chaos will reign or totalitarianism, which in the absence of democracy will dominate the world. Those of our children who survive the chaos of civil war will be subjected to harsh tyranny and actual slavery. The future that the KGB has prepared for us and our children is grim. Do you want your children to live in a world where their only dream is to serve a tyrant? This terrifying future could soon become our reality because its image is already being implanted into your consciousness by KGB agents, collaborationists who have sold our future for their own momentary personal gain. Americans, Ask yourselves, do you realize that the onslaught of destructive narratives by the KGB spread by collaborationists in our media will soon lead us to start destroying each other in a civil war? Or does this seem unlikely to you? Then remember that just 11 years ago, Ukrainians and Russians would never have imagined they would be killing each other in a brutal war. But for the past two years, this bloody war has claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. This is the bloody fate that the KGB is preparing for America. Do you know what the biggest cynicism of their strategy is? Well, it's that we, driven by KGB narratives, will be destroying our own country, believing that we are fighting for our freedom. We will believe that killing each other is our decision and that we are performing a heroic act. According to the KGB plan, America must not only be destroyed, but destroyed by our own hands. And the KGB will revel in their victory and long-awaited revenge. The unique aspect of today's historical challenge is that preventing the destruction of America and changing the course of events is within the power of no one but you, Americans. Diplomacy is powerless against this enemy's attack and military might is even more so. The key to resisting the KGB lies within you, Americans, in your convictions, in your dedication to democracy and freedom, and in your actions. Minds that seek revenge destroy states while those that seek reconciliation build nations. 
We Americans are a great nation and we will not allow the KGB to carry out their dreadful revenge plan. We have navigated the ship of America through numerous complex situations, steering it away from dark and heavy storms. America has always been renowned for its captains. Americans, the captains of America, that's you. That's why we are addressing you today. We appeal to your reason, your courage, and your freedom. Captains of America, we must free the ship of America from the clutches of the Hydra, which is steering it towards the rocks where it will shatter to pieces. We must take the helm into our own hands and steer our ship into the clear waters of the ocean of freedom and democracy to conquer new horizons. To begin with, we must pull the tentacles of this Hydra from our own minds and cleanse our perception of the destructive narratives that the KGB agents forcibly attempt to instill in each and every one of us. They are merely manipulating our images in our minds. The primary battlefield is our consciousness, and it must be defended first and foremost. We need to activate our critical thinking to the maximum extent regarding all the information we consume and not allow destructive images to penetrate through our consciousness to our hearts. If we see, hear, or read information that contains models of dissatisfaction, denial, hatred, or disappointment with our country and its people, we must not allow these messages to pass through our critical thinking, and we must consciously stop them. Just as we take care of the cleanliness of our home, we must take care of the cleanliness of our consciousness, guarding it from the infiltration of poisonous thoughts imposed by the KGB. Here, everyone must take responsibility for themselves and for America as a whole. The KGB has already dragged each of us into a war against ourselves. But now that we know their plans and methods, we can defeat them. Therefore, I appeal to your prudence, your humanity, and the spirit of democracy within each of you. Free yourselves from the KGB and narratives that manipulate you. Stand up for freedom and democracy, and most importantly, for the prosperous future of America itself. For our victory in this war, we need total mobilization. In this mobilization, we don't need to take up arms. All we need to do is remember that we are Americans. We are the heirs to the great forefathers. And we must firmly know that America was great, is great, and will always be great. Regardless of what anyone claims, trying to weaken the spirit of our patriotism, we owe it to ourselves, first and foremost, to be Americans and to carry on the great legacy. I allow myself to quote the words of the great communicator himself, President Ronald Reagan, whom I deeply respect and had the privilege to work with in the White House. President Reagan said, and let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And I allow myself to continue these words. Americans, conversations around the kitchen tables must start today and not stop until we have defeated this vile hydra of the KGB. And these conversations must be about the greatness of America, its steadfastness, its beautiful future, and how we can strengthen and fortify our beloved country. We must stop accepting the destructive images imposed on us once and for all. The information on how the KGB's Hydra operates needs to reach everybody and everyone. Take care of all citizens of the free democratic world and tell them that the truth about the reality we live in. Warn them about the goals of the KGB, about how their agents of influence operate and how they affect our minds. If we have understood the essence, explain the cause and effect relationships to other people and help them trace the narratives imposed by the KGB within themselves, 
so that they can get rid of them and also help others. We must act quickly and decisively or it will be too late. It is essential to understand the main thing. From children to elderly, we are all already at war. We are on the front line and this front line is in the mind of every citizen. To prevent the KGB from destroying America, keep an eye on the statements of opinion leaders, journalists in the media, and politicians. And if you see that someone is promoting destructive narratives, undermining democracy through these channels, do not stay silent about it. You should know if someone is using the media to sow into religious, into racial, into ethnic discord, rhetoric about the state division, the decline of America and democracy, or propagating any form of division among people, baseless negative attitudes towards any organizations, individuals, or countries. All of these are signs of KGB narratives. And these narratives are introduced into society by their agents who act as collaborationists in relationship to their own country since they betray its interest and contribute to the destruction of democracy. And if these signs are present in certain publications in the media, it means that behind them are not just journalists, but collaborationists who have betrayed their country and sold themselves to the KGB for money. I want to emphasize that we are not calling for banning others' opinions or infringing on free speech. We are instead calling for critical thinking and for the public exposure of clear instances of democracy being undermined. Remember, there is a real war going on for the future of America, for your future, for the future of your children. And each of you is more responsible than ever for its outcome. So do not retreat. Instead, boldly move forward. Use all lawful means available to actively resist it. This includes informing others that these are the deeds of the KGB agents spreading destructive narratives aimed at undermining democracy and our freedoms. Do not be afraid. Do not stay silent. If somebody tries to manipulate your opinion, violating democracy and your freedom, do not remain silent. Do not stay silent. If you see somebody publicly unfairly accused without trial or investigation, we must not remain silent when we witness injustice that threatens the very existence of America and democracy. I also call upon all editors, journalists, and opinion leaders. If you are asked to spread knowingly false information that could discredit someone's honor and deprive them of freedom, remember that you are Americans. Refuse to do so. Do not betray democracy. The significant power you hold over words and people's opinions imposes a profound obligation on you. Do not destroy our shared home where we all live. Do not betray freedom and democracy and remain faithful to America and our shared values. Remember, if you betray America and succumb to the enemy's money, they will make you destroy the walls of our shared home and then the roof will collapse on all that reside in it. To prevent anyone else from suffering at the hands of the KGB Hydra, as the volunteers of Alatra, other organizations and entire countries have, the entire democratic community must take action. We must not allow KGB agents to evade accountability. As citizens of democratic nations, we possess inalienable rights to freedom of belief and its free expression. Freedom of speech, the freedom to associate with others, the freedom of peaceful assembly, the right to development, and to participate freely in cultural life. Anyone who infringes upon these sacred rights must be held accountable. Therefore, I urge all who have ever suffered from the actions of KGB agents, who have been slandered and subjected to harassment and persecution, to not remain silent. Share your story with the world. Now that you know the true reason behind your unwarranted persecution, it is the KGB's quest for revenge. Therefore, 
Those who participated in your persecution are direct agents of the KGB and must be identified and exposed. When we realize that behind every infringement of democracy lies warfare, then we will approach it with utmost seriousness. When we identify and remove KGB agents from our democratic society, those who act against our interest, and when we interrupt their influence on our minds, we will be able to protect our rights and freedoms. When we drag this KGB Hydra into the sunlight of truth and sever its tentacles, it will become just an ordinary jellyfish that will dry out and evaporate under the sun of truth. The KGB is only strong when operating in the shadows, but they lose their power when their plans, methods, and ways of working are exposed. And that is what is happening now. That is what I urge all of us to do. Deprive the KGB of the levers of their control, their tentacles, bringing them out of the shadows into the light where they become powerless. I believe you now understand why this topic required special attention and a special format of presentation. Why we decided to communicate with you face to face so that you could see the complete picture of the KGB's actions, learn their schemes and methods of operation, to leave nothing in the shadows, to deprive this Hadra of the strength it borrowed from us, so that each of you can reclaim that strength for yourselves and direct it towards strengthening our shared home, the home of freedom and democracy. This is the first thing we must do now. We must stop the KGB Hydra before it destroys us all. And moving forward, to prevent such occurrences in the future, a necessary step will be the creation of an independent supranational civil organization with a special status. This organization would unite all democratic forces, guaranteeing protection against the infiltration of anti-democratic and destructive narratives into the fabric of our society. This organization should consist of volunteers and represent the interest of citizens of democratic countries at all levels. It should become a reliable shield against those who threaten our democratic values embody democracy, and work closely with volunteers from various other organizations. It should be accountable to the entire democratic community, not individual groups. We must ensure that KGB agents seeking to undermine the global democratic society cannot infiltrate it. We must ensure the triumph of democracy and truth by creating the civil organization which will be a reliable shield against any hydras. But this is something we will have to do a bit later. But today, the KGB hydra still permeates our society with its tentacles and controls the minds of many from the shadows. Therefore, we must exert maximum effort to bring it into the light and expose its plans and methods and to maximize international scrutiny. And only you can do this. Americans, we were on the brink of defeat and it seemed like the sun was almost setting. But I want to tell you that we have won the battle against the KGB Hydra right now. You have won because you have now learned about the existence of the hidden enemy. You have learned who the true culprit of all our woes is, who and why was splitting our world apart stirring up countries and who was committing and continues to commit acts of terror. You have learned who was organizing wars and misleading entire states, but you have also learned how to defeat this Hydra. Just a few hours ago, this KGB Hydra was competent in its victory over America. They prepared champagne and crystal glasses to drink to victory in their revenge. But now we say to them, go ahead, Drink this champagne to your eternal rest. We are Americans and we will not let the KGB Hydra have its revenge. America has always been renowned for its captains who invariably stand guard for truth and will never let evil prevail. Victory will be ours. Dear Americans, 
to ultimately win this war of the KGB against America, the most important thing left is simply for each of us to honestly ask ourselves, who am I in this fight? Am I a collaborationist or am I an American? But personally, I am an American and I believe in America and in Americans.